Good morning. Welcome to Door Community Auditorium and the Door County Talk Series. I'm Carrie Lewis, Executive Director of DCA, and I thank all of you here in person as well as those watching our live stream from their homes. We want to begin by thanking our partners and sponsors. We are grateful for the partnership of University of Wisconsin Green Bay's First Nations program and Dr. Lisa Pupart, who recommended the slate of speakers for this year's series. We are appreciative of the support of Door County Civility Project and live streaming for the series is sponsored by Jim and Kathy Steele. This is the final presentation in this year's series and we want to thank all of these partners and presenters for working with us to make this series come together. It's quite possibly my favorite lecture series of the past 11 years. Please join me in thanking all of these partners. At this time, please take a moment to silence all mobile devices and I'll talk briefly about this morning's format. We are honored to have William Quackenbush with us this morning. Mr. Quackenbush is a Ho-Chunk Deer Clan tribal member, tribal historic preservation officer, and cultural resources division manager. Mr. Quackenbush will speak for about 40 to 50 minutes, then we'll take a 20 minute break. When we come back, Mark Nelson from Door County Civility Project will say a few words about that organization. Then we'll hear the closing segment and get a chance to ask some questions. For those of you live streaming, you'll have the opportunity to send along your questions as well. We'd encourage you to either post them in the comments or send a direct message to DCA's inbox. Thanks again for joining us this morning. Please welcome William Quackenbush. Well, good morning, everyone. I didn't realize if the microphone was working over there or not when I was talking to those folks, but if so, I apologize. Um, uh, so as she mentioned, uh, my name is Bill Quackenbush. Um, I work for the Ho-Chunk Nation. That's my uh, tax paying name, they say. Now a Chuck DJ and basically, and that means nothing to most people. But in our our language, our traditional language, that means I, all I stated was my name is uh, Knox Down Fence in Ho Chunk. Uh, it's an old name. I received that name, and I believe uh, after my uh, Choka passed away, uh, who passed away in '78, there, and uh, he had that name for quite a long time, and it was quite an honor to receive uh, that same uh, name. And so, if you are asked to uh, recite my name. Hopefully you can remember, Nawa Chuck DJ. That's all you have to remember. It goes right off the tongue, right? So that said, <laughs> um, and I do, uh, throughout the uh, presentation here, I do ask uh, at times for folks to come from the crowd to help me um, uh, present today, so don't get scared. And I actually you asked for specific people. So I talked to Christine and I got her name there. So I'm gonna be bringing her up here soon enough. So that said, uh, she's already telling me to take the mask off. Way to go. I appreciate that. And uh, I just found out that she uh, lives in the area, has lived here, and I think she's mentioned the last three generations of people uh, are from Dora County, and that's really exciting to hear. Uh, Dora County, as you know, is a very beautiful place. Now, in the Ho-Chunk people, when we talk about, you know, this area here, uh, oftentimes you'll hear us referring to this area in our traditional language as uh, Mogashuch. And what I'll do is um, when I talk about, you know, this region over here, you know, the Green Bay area, right? You know, I say it's God's country. This is where the best football team in the whole entire world resides, right? Uh, we talk about an area here that uh, uh, is right about there. And I don't like, I, I'm going to apologize right now. I don't like to use laser pointers on here. Not that I have anything against modern technology here but it really gives you a telltale indication that I drink a lot of coffee, all right? <laughs> so I'll apologize for that too. Oftentimes what you'll see, I, I usually bring along a few uh, tools of the trade and I'll walk over here quite a lot and I'll point at things specific because it's just easier for me to do that. I've been doing that for quite a few years now. Uh, as she mentioned too, I work for the Ho-Chunk people over there and they, that is, an, I am a tribal member for the Ho-Chunk there and I've been working in our preservation office for 20 some years now and that's, um, that, that, to me, as a, as a career change in my life, I did quite a few things through the years. Uh, I worked in the, the field of forestry. I worked in uh, uh, distributing LP gas. 
in the community for some 10, 15 years. Uh, and then when I did a career change, I didn't realize I was actually doing that career change. Um, I had heard that our tribe was hiring in the field of envi the environmental field there under their natural resources division. And I thought that'd be a very interesting job. I like the outdoors. I like to be able to do things and it'd be interesting to work for my tribe for months. And so when I applied back in 1999, so that's kind of dating you know, right? Um, it, was a, it was a situation where when I took on that you know, change in my life here, it directly affected not only myself, but my family, but also uh, the, the, my tribe a little bit because our tribe uh, looks towards people that has uh, some knowledge, obviously, you know, as they come into there, because when you apply for those jobs, just like any other jobs on here, you put on here, oh yeah, I'm proficient at this, do this and that. I think my claim to fame at that time was that I had some knowledge on how to work with a laptop at that time or a computer. That was way, right? And that was way back when they first brought out, I passed the DOS, right? They got the Word and all the Excel and all this stuff. And I was able to do that. So that was kind of cool. So that said, let's get back on task, they say, right? Uh, now, you'll notice the title, you know, when uh, in the presentation or on the uh, flyer, it says the whole chunk, uh, history, past, present, and future. And, and there's no better place to talk about that than in Door County. Uh, we talk about our history, our state presence in our ancestral areas, a place where uh, this is where we were first placed here by our creator, and this is where our first fires were lit. And that happened in this immediate area, you know, in Door County, Mogoshuch. I'll talk a little bit about that too here. I better carry this around with me over here. Um, so, but th that title up there that I used up there, that winter life, it fits in well in here. And the main use, the reason I use a PowerPoint on here is to kind of keep me on task a little bit. And some of the imagery on here I use as well. Uh, so as I mentioned too, uh, Mogo Shooch up there, Red Banks. It'd be hard pressed to go into Door County or the Green Bay area over here nowadays and find you know, items that reflects upon the traditional name that we call this area here in our language, right? Mogoshuch means red banks. You know, and you'll find red banks or red cliffs throughout the Great Lakes region, right? Uh, but the last two glacier episodes ended up uh, adversely affecting this area here as far as our name wise on here and wiped away a lot of those, those physical attributes or aspects of why we call this place red banks. You still see remnants of that, right? Um, Seems like uh, several years ago, probably a decade ago already, I was doing some research in this area, for example, and a lot of clays that you have around here, a lot of your brick uh, fineries and such uh, is made out of this red clays from this area here. Um, in coming up here yesterday, I traveled up here and I passed a, a little stream or a creek there it was called Red Creek or Red River. I can't remember which one was on here. Um, and, and so there's remnants of, you know, why, you know, physically, you know, we refer to this area as Mogoshuch. And as you may well know, uh, native languages are very descriptive, right? Nawachuk DJ, my name, right? Knocks down fence. You know, Mogoshuch, Red Banks, all the names that you'll see on this map. I think I have a better map of this. There it is a little better. Everything you see as far as villages or streams or, or areas within our ancestral footprint for the Ho-Chung people is very descriptive, right? Nihate, right here, the big river, right? Mississippi, you know, any potal potal, round rock, or K-chunk, you know, turtle village, you know, and all these areas. So you'll learn fast that when you talk about this area traditionally here, when I say Hinuklas, everybody within the Ho-chunk that understands the language and knows where, when you hear Hinuklas, they know exactly where Lacrosse is. No different than if you guys would say like Manitowoc, right, or if you said Green Bay, you guys in your minds already know that Green Bay was something that was derived about that, that big waters that says out here that has that greenish you know, hue to it. But languages you know, is, are very descriptive if it, they're traditional or uh, native languages. So that said, um, when I talk about the history of the Ho-Chunk people in this area here, it talks about this one paragraph right here that I'll go into later. The Ho-Chunk origin story is referred to a place called Mogo Shooch or Red Banks, right? Presently known as Green Bay. Most elders will attest this is where our first fires were lit. And basically, in a nutshell, this is what you'll find today in written history about natives. One little paragraph about their history, you know, in an area. 
that, that paragraph is what's often used to describe you know, our steep presence here. Um, and I, I, do we have any archeologists and or anthropologists here today? There we go, oh, get that hand way up in the air, loud and proud, right? There you go, great. I like to pick on you folks, no, I'm kidding. So, uh, uh, so anyway, so, uh, and this is oftentimes when they write a document there to describe you know, some of their work that they do, research in an area, some of their surveys, for example. You know, you'll see this paragraph you know, written about the history, or even several paragraphs, and they talk about our steep presence here through these periods of time, right? The paleo, you know, the archaic, you know, the woodland, you know, the proto-historic, or you even hear about these little sub, you know, cultures or, you know, groups or times there, you know, the Oneota or the Mississippian. But that, but that all said, you know, when they describe us, you know, through time, they have to have a way of doing that. They just can't say, well, the whole chunk's you know, steeped history on here, and then when the Menominee and the Ojibwe, and eventually the historic periods that had came here and caused all these other tribes to infiltrate through here, whether they were pushed here from the Beaver Wars to the east, right, taking place, or if they were forced here, like the Oneidas, or these other tribes that are placed on reservations. That's hard to write, you know, as you and I would talk, but to put it down on paper, they had to find a way of doing that, so they used these, uh, these dates and times, you know, and and they still have these questions about that. It's rare that they come and ask us, you know, about, you know, our, our sense of history in Mogosut since the last glacier period. But we have an extensive history and a knowledge and we use oral history to describe that uh, to our own folks, you know, to our children, you know, to our communities. And that history that we talk about is quite pure and, and beautiful to hear. And it's very hard to change because, you know, when you tell a story, you know, certain ways of doing it. It's like I was talking to Christine today here. She was telling a story about her family and how they first came up here. What was it on a buckboard or some type of cart? And he built himself and they lived three years. I don't know how the story went there in a tent type thing. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about the thousands of years that we lived in structures much the same way in this area. We not only survived, you know, and barely got through history, but we lived here and excelled and we did it exceedingly well. So, but when we talk about the history of this area here, uh, we get into this a little more uh, later on. Um, what I do talk about a lot is the historic periods. They call it historic periods. I, I, and to tribes, that's very uh, kind of a slap in the face type thing. The historic periods for us started when uh, you know, we were first placed there, when our creator you know, placed us in Mogoshoot so, so long ago. That's our history. We have no prehistory. But, you know, as we tell the stories here, you know, in today's in school, third graders, they learn about, you know, the historic periods, you know, uh, they say in 1492, you know, Columbus sailed the blue and he discovered, you know, the Americas type thing. And that, that's what's prevalent in a lot of our, in our, our memory banks, right? Um, Wisconsin has a beautiful history, you know, um, when the French first came in the 1600s, the British in the 1700s, the early you know, Americans in the 1800s, and, and here we are still today, and history is still being made. You know, that's how history is kind of told, is through a timeline. So, um, as I mentioned, archaeologists and anthropologists, or whatever ologists, uh, sorry about that, you know, we prefer to be, um, uh, there's a way of telling history, you know, through their timeline. And, and so, but we have our own way of telling our own history. And we don't have dates and times, but we talk about stories and history and how the environment changed or how we changed as a culture or how other people we have met came and certain different things during the period of our history. So that said, oh yeah, so that old, uh, our history, oh my, it talked about, and you saw up there that picture here, and this is, I always ask, well, you know, if, did somebody take that picture? And no, of course, an artisan, right? They didn't have cameras back in 1634, because this is an artist's rendition of Jean Nicolet, stepping ashore in no other place than this, this region I have here. And uh, they met no other people than my ancestors, the Ho-Chunk people. Now, they referred to back then as the Winnebago people. You know, and it didn't really matter what they called us. We always called ourselves Ho-Chunk, right? ho chunk <clears throat> And uh, so that's just kind of the way the history unfolded there. And if you could read between the lines on here, uh, we kind of affectionately say now, well, there goes the neighborhood, right? 
Um, but that really wasn't the case at all. You know, at that media uh, period of time, we were just as anxious as, you know, the French uh, to create, you know, this connection <clears throat> because we were already seeing tribes coming from the east. I think I, um, let me go back here a little bit on here. On this map up here, we were already receiving uh, information from other tribes around us, you know, from the, uh, the Miami and the Sac and Fox and the Kickapoo and all these other tribes that were talking about all these issues they were running into with these other people coming from the east. And as they were coming here and filtrating into our area here, they met us at Goose Gehanok. They met us at, you know, Turtle Village. They met us at our council areas there to ask if they could come here and stay here either temporarily or pass through. That's just the way you did it. You don't just, you know, back then, maybe even today, you don't just come into another person's area there unannounced, right? Not, not too many good things come from that. So as they would meet and counsel at these little uh, different areas, they would ask, you know, whatever they needed, you know, and, and, and if it took place on here, they were bringing stuff with them. They were bringing things that we weren't familiar with, you know, the, the, the iron pots, you know, the, the guns and the powder and the, the metal knives. And we became anxious, you know, to gain those same items over there, even back in the 1600s there, because um, long story short, it was kind of putting us at odds because we didn't have these tools. We didn't have the beadwork and stuff to give to our, uh, you know, our, our women and our children. We were, they, are, they were having, they were, they were gaining things, you know, that we didn't have. So we we're kind of anxious to have that take place with us as well. But you don't hear too much about that in history. You hear about them coming ashore here. Uh, in short, you always hear different stories, but they state that he was looking for an easier passage to the Orient there for him to uh, be able to begin this trade and network right along, you know, side, you know, these early explorers, along with Jean Nicolet, uh, Kenzo's Jesuit priest, you know, they always hear these, you know, the black robes, right? You know, you know, this, you know, they wanted to come here and Christianize all these savages, right, in this area here, or, or do away with them forever, because this land manifests destiny, right? And this, this land is for ours for the taking. If you want to do any research, you know, uh, go and look up manifest destiny, and you'll learn a lot about why there's such a drive in order to have this area called, you know, Americas. <clears throat> so anyway, on this process on here, you'll see that uh, one of the things that took place after the French got here and established themselves, um, they'd often hear about all oh, this beautiful area here. And the fur trade was big drive back then, right? You know, they're, you know, hides were king back then, you know, and beaver, the beaver trade, you know, was taking place and the French wanted this. And you'll hear this battle between these two big fur trading companies back then and they're trying to establish connections with tribes that had the ability to bring them their value product. And what they would do is they'd trade for it here. Let me see if I can get to it. There's one. This image down here, French fur traders at the bay, right here, right around this region on here. They came here with many good gifts, right? Um, the knives and the, the pots and the beadwork. And we had, you know, in exchange, the many valued things that they wanted to take back with them. Because they would take all of this stuff back, you know, with them to give to their, their people. And uh, so there was an anxious process that was taking place in the establishments, but in the background, of course, is a fort because there was, you know, no real trust back then. Maybe there was. Um, but oftentimes uh, they would build a fort or build a place to trade. And, uh, and Green Bay was a good example of that. That fort changed hands numerous times, as you guys all know. And uh, so when the French uh, got here, uh, they acknowledged the whole chunk and our ancestral footprint, our territory, which I didn't uh, really talk about too much. But you see the Wisconsin up there? If you put your hand up here, we're not the only. M Michigan isn't the only one that has a mitt, folks. Wisconsin's got a better looking hand. Uh, so in that Green Bay area right in here, so that's where we're at, right up that thumb right here. Uh, from Mogo Shoots all the way over to where St. Paul or Minneapolis over there is today, all the way down that Nihate, that big river, right on down to where the Illinois River confluences, all the way back up to Gushke Hanang, Green, you know, up to Chicago area here. That whole area there, ancestrally, we say you could travel at one time and you'd run into no one else but other Ho Chunk people. That was a big footprint. I think, uh, I think um, they said it was like 10.5 million acres. Now that's could be here or there, um, but it was a, a large track of mine, land. 
I live in Black River Falls area. That's where I was born and raised. That's where I got married and I raised a family, still raising them. You know, so, and that's a, that's a large area right here. Right along this area right here. That's, that's not a good map either. That's, um, but it kind of shows, you know, that I live in a comfortable area that I can ancestrally say this is my, this is where my parents and grandparents and, and my, my ancestors have always lived, always. It's kind of a long time back. To, to show that, what I can do, talk about this process that unfolds right on here. I talk about the British coming in here, you know, and the British being pushed out. You guys all know the story about the British and the early Americans coming here. And then, then it was just free for the taking for the most part, right? We became a territory. You know, I'm going to ask Chris, Christine and the lady next to her to come up here. Then the next four people to come up on stage, if you don't mind. I hope you guys have presented to a crowd. I hope you guys have your parts ready. There you go. So I'm going to ask you to help me for a little bit. You won't have to say too much, if anything. So, All right. I'm glad I met somebody here local today. This is going to be very impressed in her memory banks here, too. Uh, Christine, you're going to stand in front of me, but you're going to hold this rope. No, you're going to stand right here and take this edge of this rope. And then your friend is going to take this rope and you're going to hold it right about here. Okay, the next lady here, you're going to hold it right about here. Oh, that one. Sorry about that. And this lady here is going to unroll it all the way to the end. Okay, okay so you guys are going to then this individual, the, the tall, young, strapping young man over here, come on over here. <laughs> you're going to hold that up. I think you're going to hold it um. You're going to follow her, and there's going to be a ribbon on the end of that. Okay, that's it. And this lady's going to actually put your hand, if you don't mind. You got mad, sorry about this. And you're going to hold this one right here. Oh. Yeah, just like very close. Okay, here we go. Very easy. Christine, you were talking about the history, and you wanted me to talk a little bit about this area to here. From this point on, when you see this lady walking around at all the restaurants out there, or whatever she does here on a daily living on here, you're going to call her Miss 2022, because she's holding today's date right there. Right, Miss 2022. You're gonna, who are you? 1634. That's right. Gina Calais, she don't look like him right now, but she is, that's Gina Calais. Who sailed the blue? 1492. Who's this? Columbus. You're Miss, Mr. Columbus, sorry about that. That's okay. <laughs> okay, you got a very important date. One. Okay, perfect, there you go, so here it is. Historically, when you read in your history books on here, when the Americas were discovered to today, this is the history of time now. She holds in the blue over there. What was your first name? Yeah, there you go. I won't remember that in 10 minutes, I guarantee it. But anyway, so uh, she, yeah, so she's, she's 12,000 years ago. That's the last glacier episode that took place here that affected it environmentally this very area right there, 12,000 years. Every inch on this rope, 50 foot rope, is 20 years. So that said, he holds a very important date in our Ho-Chunk history. Can you tell me that date? Read it loud. Okay, yeah, he said. Yeah, so what he's saying in Ho-Chunk is, it's when the earth and the ice uh, created a dam on Nihate, the big Mississippi River there at one point in time. That many years ago over there, it caused the water to flow for a short period of time up what is known as the Wisconsin River today. So all that ice that was breaking off on there is Nuhma Ruha Nihate. It was easy to say, wasn't it? So that's a date. That's a date and time. No different than the dates from here to here. There are certain dates in here in our history that's very prominent in our stories. Different dates and times when he's talking, talking about there, our ancestors were here to witness that. And they were, called, they were sitting in a place called, you know, our place of refuge. I have a, a, a really interesting story that was told by Jim Funmaker of old. He passed away now, um, but uh, he's talked about a story over there one time because uh, uh, NRCS came to us one time and they asked about, well, you guys always say you've been here ancestrally in that Wisconsin area or here. Uh, do you have anything in your history that talks about the soil series that we find that's unique along the Wisconsin River down there from the Mississippi on up to about where Richland County is up there, Muscaday area? 
And so Jim Funmaker, in short, you know, uh, was asked about this. And as good elders go, he didn't have that story immediately on his mind as we asked him that. But he, so he said, well, let me get back to you, you know, um, and, back, and the next week, sure enough, he come back in because he had come to our office. I, I should have put a picture of him. He was about this tall, 90-some years old, old Jim Funmaker there. And he came into our office at that time when I worked in that environmental office, right, years ago. And uh, he had this little snake in this box. And uh, he come in there all frustrated, just all really bent. And he said, hey, Chuchke, he said, this snake shouldn't be here. He was talking about this snake and these dead birds that you're finding along the roads and all this environmental change that's happening in one generation. This shouldn't be taking place. We didn't know what to do. Did, you know, I didn't know if he physically wanted me to take that snake back down south where it needed to go, or did, did he want us to do something? And what he was trying to get across to us, that, you, know, you work for our tribe, you work for a government, you have the ability to go out there and complain to whoever needs to be complained to, to talk about our environment and how we're affecting it you know, adversely, you know, what we're you know, traditionally comfortable at seeing our environment be at. Well, anyway, as that story was unfolding there, and he was becoming frustrated because we really didn't know what to do for him, you know, on here, that's when this individual, his name I believe Jim Radke was, over here for NRCS, he had asked us about, do you have any knowledge about, you know, the history long ago and why this, you know, soil, soil series that they found uh, would have occurred? Because it was relatively recent in history, but it's a unique soil series you can't find hardly anywhere else in the world. And so we asked Jim that as leaving because he had knowledge, you know, extensive knowledge, and, uh, but he didn't have that exact story to tell us immediately. And so he said, I'll, I'll, I'll come back and I'll, if I get that story. <clears throat> and so they, you know, so our, our, our department or division was going to take it over to the traditional courts. One of our tribal governments has, a, a, you know, the judicial side, and we have this luxury as a tribe within our judicial system, we have this traditional courts comprised of, you know, supposedly, you know, our 12 clans has, you know, one, you know, main individual and then an alternate to sit on this traditional courts there. So we could go there every Monday, they meet every Monday, still do. And you go and ask them a question and they're an advisory committee, they can give you this traditional answer. They, you know, there's a lot of, there's eight, they said on average like 800 and some years of knowledge sitting in that one room, sitting in fire in the center, same old thing. Very enjoyable to go there. <clears throat> So they went there. I asked that question that Jim Rackety asked us, and they were, they were thinking and pondering on it too, and they were want, you know, wanted to go back. But anyway, so Jim Funmaker got a hold of us right away. He goes, hey, Chuchke, you know, I was talking to these folks, and he says, I got that story. That's when the ice and you know, the, you know, the earth causes ice dam uh, just below where Purdy Sheen sits today, you know, to de temporarily cause the water to flow up the Wisconsin River or that area there. <clears throat> and as it would flow up there, it filled up that area there and it caused this, you know, temporary glacier lake. And as that lake sat there, obviously, you know, the water that was coming down the Mississippi, it had, you know, had sediment in it there and it must have, you know, slowed up and it sedimented out. And then when that ice dam finally broke away, it all went back to what it is. And that's when they were talking about a different story there. Now, there's several stories to talk about when the Wisconsin River flew backwards, a different story. Ruchma, Ruhani, is a story about this dam that caused this ice to flow. And in short, what was taking place was he was talking about an oral story that was passed on through many thousands of years of our history because it changed us here, it changed our you know, environment, it changed our culture to some degree, that big glacier episode. And so when he was talking about Nuchma Ruha Nichete down there, um, it was hard for them to understand, you know, that our ancestors had to be sitting there in that place of, you know, refuge. This, and nowadays in tourism, they always hear about, um, uh, they always hear about, uh, what do they call it down there? The, the driftless area. You know, the driftless area is like a tourism thing where wherever the glacier, last two glaciers hadn't, you know, uh, directly affected what it did. It did affect us, you know, and our history talks about that. So in short, I thought that was pretty cool. They went down there and took a few samples of that, did a soil series test on it there, and sure enough, the soils came from where the Minnesota River and the St. Croix and the Mississippi took those soils that that ice had captured and uh, was melting away, 
and sedimenting into the stream there when it come up the Wisconsin River, it slowed up, it sedimented out, and it created its own unique soil series in this little footprint. Still there today. And they thought that was pretty cool. So they decided to, uh, since it was a newly discovered soil series, they'd name that after what Jim had called it there. Uh, so if you go into uh, the Richland County Soil Series you know, book, I guess every county has their own soil series book. Uh, on, on a certain page there, you'll see the soil series and they named Nuhma Soil Series in their book, which is kind of cool. So, and it's so, but you, what you'll find is that our history, you know, has a way of, you know, assisting, you know, science to some degree now. Uh, so there was this discussion that took place there and they were talking about this, you know, how, you know, everybody liked to get their little feathers in their hats and stuff. So they're making this big announcement that the soil series, you know, was discovered and that uh, through this story over here, uh, they dedicated that name towards uh, uh, this one that was given to them uh, by Jim Funmaker. And so there was this conversation taking place and the NRCS representative says, and now the whole chunk history stories are starting to back up our science. And Jim Funmaker made a comment that no, you know, that your science is now beginning to back up our oral history, right? Our oral history has been here ever since we can remember. Your science is just getting here. And so, and I, I believe that's the case. You know, it's kind of nice to have, you know, science, you know, uh, now beginning to, you know, talk a little more about the, you know, the factual history in this area. And how does that relate into our history here? Uh, and it has to, right, in some way, shape, or form, because if it doesn't match our history, then it's wrong. One of them is wrong. So that said, that's a, an important story to tell because that history of ours, you know, plays an important role because that glacier played such an important role in our life and our change, our adaptation, and we're still here today. And there's a reason why for that. And so this, this lady plays an important date. What was your date? One. Oh, one. So, okay, so what's her name? I said... This guy, I'm sorry I'm using gals for guys here, but this guy, they said at one time on the other side of this earth over here had walked here for a short period of time. He made such an impact on us, you know, that it affected our calendars. It affected these people coming here, you know, legions of people here trying to teach us about him, right? His religion, oh, you're Jesus Christ, by the way. So next time you see this lady, there's Jesus, right? There you go. There you go. And, uh, but it, whether this took place or not in history, it still has affected us, right? So there's dates on this rope here that should tell you though that even throughout the history that was taking place on the other side of the earth here, what was this date? 1300. 1300, what is this date over here? There's a period of time here. Yeah, it was in BC. 300 BC, oh, okay. yeah. And uh, this period of time here, this arm length here obviously is a lot longer, right? Than uh, this little dinosaur arm over here of history on here. But there was a culture and a, a period of time in here of, of a group of individuals living here, Ho-Chunk, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hint at that already, uh, that was something that was taking place as cultural change in here. And from this date on here to this date on here, maybe I can ask that archaeologist what, what began to take place throughout the Wisconsin and Illinois and Minnesota and Iowa area. That still has a physical presence here on the ground in shape of earthworks, Right, the effigy mounds, the mound systems that you hear so much about today, the conical mounds, the linears, the effigy mounds, the transformation of a process that we began to use in this area here to help mark our burial systems, these mortuaries, right, and these earthworks. I took a little drive this morning here because I was drinking coffee way at daylight this morning. So I drove around Fish Creek a little bit. I drove around down there by Egg Harbor down here. You guys are crazy here. No, I'm not saying that, but you guys are so interesting because you guys are doing the exact same thing that humans have always did on here. We like to mark our spots, right? Uh, so around here, you see all these metal sculptures and all these signs and all this shaping of different things on here because our ancestors or our kids and our grandkids and their kids, you know, a thousand years from now, down that rope down here, they're going to look back on there and they may look at those things. They'll kind of wonder what they are. They want to study it. Might not even be us, right? They want to study all that stuff. They want to find about, out about you peoples right here. And that's what happens when an archaeologist starts uh, going through those series of soils, right? Down there, they talk about, uh, you know, 
all the farming equipment on here, the forestry stuff of old, all the way down to those, um, you know, woodland period stones and hand tools, down to the archaic period of stool, stone, stones and tools, all the way back there. 12,000 years ago, I'm just throwing that date out there because nobody really knows. But that period of time back on there, there was these unique types of stone tools around this area here uh, that you will see archaeologists talk about to show how far back human presence was in Wisconsin. <clears throat> see if I can get to it. Yeah, here we go. All right, here we go. So this is very grainy. But basically, they'll talk about the series of adaptations through time on here uh, from tool, tool use over here, right from the Paleo, which they call the Clovis Point. I don't know where that means. Um, all the way, all the way up, all the way up to the protohistoric, where the, you know, arrows and bird points, you know, all the way up. And then what, what timeline goes this way? What replaces the stone tools, right? Metal, right? And the moment you started getting metal, you, know, you could throw a lot of the stuff away here, right? This is more durable metal was, right? Right? Well, you can tell the same timeline through the use of copper up in this area. You get up to the northern half up there to the Upers, right? Up there, and then talk about all the culture, you know, copper that we used to trade a lot and, and moved up and down the Mississippi River. So you'll find remnants of this all over the place. But this, this, this timeline from 12,000 years ago when they were harvesting the mastodon, a short-faced bear, that's where my name comes from, right? Now it's Chuck Pige. It's hard to, hard to explain. I can tell that story sometime too. Uh, but it's the harvesting of these large uh, megafauna uh, all the way up to where the caribou and elk and the buffalo and the white-tailed deer and all this stuff had to take place. And we had to adapt as humans in this area. We would have ceased to exist right alongside you know, those animals of old, right? Our environment changed so much that those mastodons are no longer here. Maybe in part because we over harvested them? I don't know. Nobody really talks about that. But the environment changed to where, you know, this ice, when it was coming off Wisconsin area I'm here, that earth is just like a big sponge. It starts kind of coming back, you know, up a little bit and all those wetlands, you know, right? They start kind of filling in with soils and, and different things come here. I have stories that talk about, you know, the first plants in the pine, but the white oak, when it first come here, white oak is sacred to the Ho-Chunk people. And the reason being, it brought us so many great gifts, right? And when all these plants were being reestablished along this, you know, timeline on here, you know, it was something that we decided to pass on to our kids and our grandkids, you know, so they understand where they come from and so that they don't necessarily make the same mistakes, you know, uh, and have to repeat them in the future. They can learn from that process. That's just the way we all are as humans, right? So that's stone right here. This is a, a those little pudgy fingers look pretty close. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't, I don't know. They're very, they're very strong fingers right here. There you go. Now that's Hickston Quartzite. It comes from a place just north of my, my where I live there, maybe 12 miles. And Hickston Quartzite, uh, you'll still find in our many travels along the Mississippi, all the way down to the Gulf, all where the watersheds go up, all those fingers of streams over there, you'll find history being taken along with them because this was a very valued commodity to the Ho-Chunk people, still is today, because it's in our stories that tells us how our presence were. This Clovis Point, remember, 12,000 years ago, was made back then, and I have it. I have several of them, actually, and it's still as sharp as they made it. It's just the way it is, right? But it tells a beautiful story because it puts us in a presence here in Wisconsin, over here, way back from Silver Mountain when they you know, brought it out there and they made that. And they would make them into blanks back then and travel and they'd gift them away because we had to have something of value from our area that we would take to different places along the Mississippi, up to you know, all the different river systems and, and trade was good because this was a valuable commodity and we'd bring stuff back for our women and children and our elders. Right? That's just the way the trade has always been. But the Sixton Quartzite is a valued commodity to us because it tells us that even back then, we had the ability to utilize uh, what our grandmother, the earth, gives us, right? Um, and so that's, that's a beautiful um, part of our history right there. Oh, <laughs> look at here. That is, that's what timeline really looks like, you guys. No, I'm kidding, you guys. Um, so 
Um, if you want, oh, you guys didn't have to stand up here either, by the way. If you guys want to just set the rope down and wind it back up, that'd be really great. Uh, thank these folks for helping me out with the timeline. That's really good. I didn't want to mention that lady back there in the blue. Her name was uh, old grandmother Ice back in there, but it doesn't really matter. She's old, that lady. So, well, there you go. So yeah, you can set the rope down. She'll wind it up and thank you guys. I appreciate that. Yeah, Christine, you can stay up here. No, I'm teasing. No, you go. Yeah, yeah. And you need to lay right on the floor over there if you'd like to. But uh, that said, this timeline on here, uh, it, it, um, I needed a way of uh, telling to groups, you know, of all um, ages and, and, and cultures and beliefs and or whatever it takes on here, uh, the ability to talk about the history of the Ho-Chunk and that there's much more to Wisconsin than before the French were here. And that if, if Wisconsin really wanted to tell a beautiful story, they'd include our entire history here. You know, you go to the Wisconsin and Madison and the historic side of there, and 99% of the history that they hear talks about the historic periods on here. Uh, but if you go into that venture into that field of, you know, archaeology, uh, they talk about the period of times all the way back, but there's no history about that. But what happens is that when they do this study through here, they'll take those few stone tools. And during the period of time when that, the, those mounds were being, you know, placed on the earth over here, uh, pottery began to arrive, right? And agriculture, as we know it today, started in Wisconsin some 2,000 years ago, right? Somebody said something. Did I see something? No. I think they referred to another uh, presentations here about, you know, the uh, groups of people bringing their own seed here and trade and such and this and that. That has always taken place. That is, that is the case. The Ho-Chunk people are one of the few people east of the Mississippi that can still state that we live in our ancestral homelands. We fought and died. We really had a hard time remaining here, but we still are here. Uh, that said, uh, there was, I think, no less than five different attempts to place Ho-Chunk on reservations uh, back in the you know, 1800s there, out of state. Uh, Turkey River in you know, Iowa, right? Up to Long Prairie, Minnesota, the Blue Earth, Minnesota. Then they tried to put us all the way out to South Dakota on a reservation. And some of our stories are Trail of Tears. Tribes have this ability to talk about these Trail of Tears, right? How many ancestors we lost, the thousands of people we lost from starvation and sickness and disease, all the while being rounded up by the point of gun there to take us off our ancestral footprint. And other tribes we saw being placed on reservations in our area from the east, which never made much sense to me. They tried to get us across, you know, the, the Mississippi River, and there's reasons for that. You'll see if you study uh, governmental history on here, uh, the IRA, the, in, any removal act, right? You know, the process of we just, we just need this land, you know, and you guys are on it. We're, we're, we're citizens, I think we're humans, we're just like you, but we need to be off here for the next group to come in here, I guess. Anyway, so, and I, I, I can talk for hours about the land sessions, which we may touch upon, and the ensuing removal process on here. Um, but that said, this timeline uh, becomes an, an effective tool so people can kind of gain an understanding real time, you know, of the history, you know, that we all have the ability to tell in this area here. Uh, when you go out there, if you got, you know, a garden in the backyard and you're digging around and all of a sudden, poof, here comes a stone tool out of the ground there. Now you can go over to your local archaeologist and he can actually lay that or lay that up or and lay that up there and they can say well yeah that was that stone tool was made you know some in this area that you know that archaic period you know there you don't find too many paleo sites around here because a glacier kind of played around up here too much yet uh, but there's they say that i think there's one or two sites even in door county that has a paleo you know attributes to it but anyway no matter what they can tell you where that stone was made and then have that piece of history right that stone tool and say oh man that was made by a human you know so long ago and that's pretty cool and um and a few pieces of pottery during that right in this period here when those mounds are being in here you know that pottery that went away quickly because we were able to get you know gain you know the iron, the iron pots and such on here it all kind of in part helps talk a little bit about the history on a practical side about the uh, ho-chunk people but oftentimes what you'll find is they'll they'll want to also tell you you know about your culture right uh, your livelihood they want to tell you you know how your family units were made they want to tell you everything under the sun about us as a people 
They're not really even asking us over here. But they talk about it all the way over here, and they want to put it down in books, and their theories and their other things over here talk about uh, who they think or surmise and uh, who we were and who we even are today. So that past and the present and the future part of our history on here, that past, it's set in stone, quite literally, right? That doesn't change. That's our history. We tell our stories time and time again, the exact same way, pass it on, and it's a redundant process. Uh, it's a little different than if, you know, I sat down next to Christine over there and I whispered into your, hey, Christine. By the time I got to the end of that person over there, that story would have totally changed, right? So how do you pass down history accurately? That's a game, you know, right? Everybody knows that's a game. Well, we, you know, the whole chunk people, we have the ability to pass on our history through various ways. You know, no different than other tribes, no different than, you know, all groups around the world. We do it through redundancy, right? Keep telling them time and time again over there, eventually something sinks in those hard rocks, right? Up there. So if I ask this individual right here, sitting in the front, he's eager to get up on stage, but you don't have to move. So if I said Jack and Jill went up the hill, what's the next line? Fetch a pail of water. That's just driven into our head. And when did they do that? When we were little kids, right? And we'll, we'll hold that on to this day. So you've told your children and your children are telling your children that Jack and Jill story, hopefully. Because it's just the way we pass on knowledge. Our history is, in part, a little way of doing that. So that, was that, that tent, you know, these tents that you were talking about, we lived in for three years on here. During the winter time up there, let me see if I can get to something like that. Oh, yeah, I was going to tell you, this is cute. Make sure you stop me for that break, too. All right? This is an artist's rendition. This is not a real picture, believe it or not. This is a rendition of some sort of how life along the glacier system was of old. You had a whole bunch of Jesus Christ looking people here, right? The beard and the black hair. Uh, throwing bowls and arrows. You know, the arrows here, right? Way back then. Um, and they had cooking pork hocks over the fire over here. And this was life. And this is what we're teaching our children. This is what you see in books over here. In reality, you know, this is what a glacier looks like after it recedes to that great degree of speed that was causing those big shards to break off and, and lodging themselves on the Mississippi River there and causing that issue, you know, with water running backwards up to Wisconsin for a period of time. When I talk about that period of time, that's different than the glacier lake that you hear about when you go down I-90 from Minneapolis to, you know, uh, uh, Chicago or Madison, Milwaukee. Uh, they, the Glacier Lake, you'll see those castle rocks there by Camp Douglas and so on and so forth. That's a different lake. That's, that we have stories, like beautiful stories that talks about the Wisconsin River and the formation of that process of the Dells area down here. They talk about this, you know, one story of, of this great water spirit, you know, and with all his wrath began to come down the river. And you, you stop to think about that story. <clears throat> and that ice that was receding on here and that water was holding back on that glacier lake, beginning allowing it to cut underneath, finally. And that noise, the sound, can you imagine the sound of a glacier falling apart and all that deluge of water washing underneath and causing what you see in the Dells area today and the beautiful stories that had to take place back then. <clears throat> and that's a different story. But this is what a glacier in short looks like right here afterwards. It scarcifies the ground. There's nothing left. It piles it all up and it washes it away. And so it takes literally hundreds if not thousands of years for the soils to come back, right? So you don't live alongside it. You don't live on the ice. Some do, you know, Eskimos. I don't know, I don't know what culture. Uh, they prefer to do that. Um, but the Ho-Chunk preferred to live in what I mentioned, the place of refuge. Jim talks about all these wonderful, beautiful stories about our history and how we watched our environment change before our eyes. And we thought it was so great that we would put it down in writing, right? In our stories, in our songs, our history, they say, you know, they talk about how long we've been here, you know? And uh, you say, well, how do you know it's down in writing? Well, archeologists will tell you that. You go to our rock cart, right? You'll see the many stories, beautiful stories that we have been writing over here. Jim took us to a, a place over there by Lighthouse Rock. And Jim was a really good resource for me. When I transferred from environmental resources over to culture resources, one division, same department, <clears throat> my world changed. 
uh, because now I was required, instead of interested and dabbling, now I was required to learn. And so there was a steep learning curve above learning history about the Ho-Chunk people over here. Oh, that's pretty. To having to know the knowledge of the Ho-Chunk people here ever since we've been here, because I, as a tribal historic preservation officer, now have to go and sit government to government across the table there to protect our culture and our history and our heritage in this area here, because we live in a day in a society that thinks nothing of destroying history to make history. That's just kind of the way it is. <clears throat> so a lot of the road projects out there that you see that are cutting a new road through here, and there's some burials over there, these effigy mounds that are here, they'll put in a request to the historic site, hey, can I uh, put my road through there uh, and destroy that earthworks, earthworks that we don't make anymore, right? Part of our history that would be gone forever. Okay, right? and I put this road in here because this road is very important. Um, Christine had to get from point A to point B just two minutes quicker. That's right. So I'm, I'm going to pick on you now, Christine. <clears throat> so, so I got to go into that table there and say, well, listen now, you know, it's not just our history; it's everybody's history. You're destroying a part of our culture and heritage of the Americas. I mean, you have federal regulations out there, states on here that you need to take into consideration the effects, adverse effects to destroying these things out here because you're not going to get them back again. We're not making no more mounds. Nobody around here is making any more mounds. They better not be, at least, right? And so you're losing part of your history and culture. And we've lost a lot of them in this area here. And that's just one example of how it's very hard for us as tribes to protect our culture and history in this area here. Oh, yeah, by the way, <clears throat> in those mound systems, there just happens to be our ancestors are buried there, the state law, in fact, 157.70 in Wisconsin, states, matter of fact, the earthworks are nothing more than burial markers, right? Gravestones are burial markers. Go there to Arlington Cemetery and they have a stone there of an unknown soldier, right? And that's a burial marker. And can you imagine going and putting a request in there to run uh, you know, a power line over the top and or underneath or plow right on straight through Arlington Cemetery there because the need was great for this expressway, you, you just wouldn't do it. Can you imagine going to uh, this church that sits on top of a hill over here with a surrounded by cemetery right over here and ask that, can we you know, put a road right straight through there just okay with you guys because it's easier? You just don't do it. But when it comes to our history and culture and our significant sites, there's something different about that. I don't know why it is. And so now that's why we have to go there and fight and protect. You know, our culture resources no different than all the other societies or groups of people that we live in. So I got off on a tangent and I warned you to tell me to stay on task almost. So, uh, but anyway, so, so that's how I talk about Jim Funmaker, Jim Radke, and blah, 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 Soils page. There it is. I actually I should have went to here. Sorry about that, folks. Here it is, that's what you'll find in, written down in history now. And it's so weird because I can say that exact same thing. And it's hearsay and it's oral history and it's fables and it's mystical and whatever it is that natives do here. But if you put it down in writing, it also becomes factual. It's citable material all of a sudden for some reason. Well, there it is. <clears throat> so one of the things I do talk about, you know, about the environmental change, you know, about our past history and why it's so important to protect those hierarchies of life, to pass on to the generations in the future for not only our children and families and our culture, but for everybody's on there because we all live on this same earth, right? That you need to protect our water, priorities of life, right? Water, food, shelter, right? Social economics, so you can find this 101, right? You know, who makes, you know, you know, a better resource than humans, you know, for that type of study. Uh, but we've got to protect our water. If we don't begin to protect our water, you know, any more than we are, we're, we're, we're going down the wrong road. You know, we're destroying it left and right. We're allowing the big business out there to take that clean water that you guys want and desire every day. You get up, you take a drink of water, or put it in your coffee, right? Um, it might not be there. You know, they said the Great Lakes, you know, are, are, plays an important role in that process, and we live here. When was the last time you went out there and thought about protecting our water, right? Because if once it's gone, it's gone. Right? I have so many beautiful stories that talks about the protection of water. And 
uh, a couple of them, have, one in specific is talking to uh, Donald Blackhawk, who's also passed away, but he sat on his traditional courts. And he talked about the importance of the protecting of, of this water. Um, and uh, he, he said something that was interesting. He says, you know, you know, as we grow up and we gain knowledge and, and we're instructed to carry on, you know, that, that uh, you're supposed to uh, uh, live, live in accordance of, and they call it a way of life. You know, he was just talking kind of like we're kind of sitting alongside a van there at a site down there by Beloit down there. <clears throat> and I had asked him a question about, you know, at that time I was talking to him, uh, Wisconsin just had their first several cases of CWD in the deer where their ears flop over and they start walking around. And even though, even you guys can hunt deer then when they do that, they say, but no, I'm kidding. Um, but deer get all any wampus in their heads and it's a disease. And I was asking him down, I says, you know, we were sitting there, a group of them, we had taken a van of traditional uh, courts members down to Beloit there for a certain matter. I asked him, I said, you know, these deer, I said, what are we going to do? I mean, you know, do you use them for doings in traditional ways? So what are you going to use if the deer, we can't use them to eat anymore for, um, for, for our needs? And Donald just sat there and thought about it a little bit. He goes, you know, you know, uh, let me tell you a little story. That's, I just love that when an elder would say, let me tell you a little story. <laughs> well, so then he started talking about, you know, invasive species, the deer at one time weren't ever here, right? You know, well, in their history, he talks about, you know, this progression that always takes place and how we need to adapt and utilize what our grandmother, the earth gives us, you know, uh, to the best of our ability. Um, and environmental wise, we're supposed to kind of like utilize her and help her along in, in, in kindness and then leave her a little better for the next generation. Uh, and we're really missing that mark, that past and the present in our history, that future part, we're really dropping the ball you know, together collectively because we're having a few, we're having a hard time um, of passing on something better for the next generation. You know? um, we're doing it, we, we, we do it in many good ways, but we may be doing it adversely in another, they call it that yin and yang process a little bit, right? You're doing something really good over here, but it's really suffering over here from that. <clears throat> the water plays such an important role in our history, our history, that we need to protect and preserve that process in order to perpetuate it to the future. Uh, and the winter food brought up, and a lot of people all talk about, oh man, uh, that's why I had that winter uh, life up there too. It was a presentation I was giving to a group down there by uh, Platteville, Wisconsin. And they asked, well, how did you guys live in the winter in this area? I mean, it's just terrible. I mean, we all, I only got like a foot of snow. You guys got snow up here too. So you guys should really consider talking about um, becoming part of Canada or something. You guys got a lot of weather up here. So. But no, so food with diversity of food that we have in Wisconsin, even to this day, I was sitting in the back break room over here too. Um, and uh, there was a book laying there and it said, uh, I think it said Door County Wildflowers. And it's so interesting to see that you, you see maize or corn, they call it, right? You know, um, dried potatoes here. That's a, not the potatoes, you know, it's, you know, traditional potatoes that you get out of a marsh over here. You know, all the different types of shells and the berries and nuts and barks and all these other things that you can utilize even to this day as food. And I was asked by her friend over here, um, but how did you put that? Do you guys use your plants or whatever it is like that? And I said, yeah, we use them quite extensively. In fact, we, within our own tribe, if we were given the chance to live the way we see fit and not be squirreled away on these little reservations out here, we have the ability to utilize the area, very area that we live in. And, but the many plants, right, that we have, uh, the many different types of diversity of meat, I mean, uh, two or three times now, I've been trying to get up here uh, with a real good friend from Madison area. His name is uh, Chris James. If you guys know Chris James, he comes to this very area here and he goes out here and does white fishing every year. And uh, the history that we have in this area here is such a bountiful area. Oh, such a bountiful area in this region over here that was a preferred place to come here for certain things during the year. Even my mother and my choka, my grandfather, used to come up here with their families up here certain times a year on a little different matter. They used to come up here to help harvest uh, some of the apples and such up in here because they had to do that. We were, back when my mother was young, we were not considered, you know, very favorably in secular society for work. So they made baskets along the high roadways. You hear about all the basket stands, right? Now, all, all the harvesting of cranberries in the fall, cutting the pulp, pulling moss. If you ever pulled moss, 
Raise your hand. I have pulled moss. There you go. All of these things I had to do as seasonal workers in here on a very ancestral footprint that we lived in here because we were looked at differently than anybody else. I mean, when I was growing up here, I had no chance to go to college. If there was a chance for going to college, I didn't know what it was. I knew exactly when I graduated, and I was graduating early here, that I was going to go into the workforce. That's all there was to it. Nowadays, kids, our tribes, you know, become becomes a little better adapted, and they can send our kids to college and reimburse them if they get good grades, and we can carry on. And those kids, you know, hopefully gain a higher education, and they can bring it back and help us as potentially as a you know people. <clears throat> We're, I talk a little bit about the different aspects of how we took care of ourselves, you know, teaching the young ones on how to uh, harvest cranberries, right, and utilize them as food out there. And these, are not, these, aren't just, these aren't cranberries out of a bed. These are cranberries out of a marsh. If you ever wanted to have a beautiful meal, and I'm going to leave this as a break on here, you want to take some of our traditional rice that we still have around us, you know, on these lakes out here, and take some dehydrated cranberries and some blueberries and some maple syrup. Mix them together in there. It makes it just a beautiful dish, very high in protein, very high energy. That's just a wonderful dish. And there is, I have a lady, a lady, I have a good friend who puts on this food sovereignty process. And she has to have three tables on here. I think she has 100, what'd she say, 140 some different types of food on this for you to exam, you know, to sample on there of all the foods just within our local area down there by Black River area. It was just a wonderful way of seeing all the different types of meats and nuts and berries and all the food down there that we harvest to, even to this day out there. So I'm going to leave it at that. I guess we have to take a break here, and I'll come back and I'll. I'll the next picture we're going to talk about is this one right here. There you go.
You guys are missing out on so much history here. There. This must be Mark. Okay, Mark, you can come over here. I'm just turning back to a map here. So. There it is. You got a different microphone? Yeah. Okay. Hello, everyone. Again, uh, Mark Nelson with the Door County Civility Project. Uh, for the last six years, we've been co-sponsoring these uh, series of speakers with the Door County Community Auditorium. And just to give you a little more detail, we have these nine tools of pay attention, listen, be inclusive, don't gossip, show respect, be agreeable, apologize, give constructive criticism, and take responsibility. Just to give you a feel for what we do in our training sessions, for example, listening. You know, listening is really an art form. And if that's true, according to my wife, I'm a starving artist. But I will say what things we try to tell people is this, is that listening is extremely hard. And when you think about K through 12th grade school, we teach kids how to read and write and do math and stuff, and all the communications is from their mind out. We never teach listening. And it is so difficult for three major reasons. One, uh, brains make con come to conclusions 55% uh, based on what they see, 38% of the way the person looks, and only 7% of what the words are. And on top of that, our minds work seven times faster than our, brain, our mouths. And so as Stephen Covey observed, people don't listen to learn, they listen to respond. And finally, one of the biggest mistakes we make in listening is to have the assumption that we all have the same understanding of words. My sister had a recent conversation with her daughter who was pregnant, and her, she was in, on the phone, and in, the daughter was in tears because she wasn't going to have a wedding shower to her you know, knowledge. No one was planning it. And my sister said, well, of course not, because for her, a wedding shower was uh, all ladies in hats and white gloves talking about baby poop. But to my niece, a uh, baby shower was a barbecue in the backyard with couples. So when my sister found out her meaning of it, she was easy, happy to organize and get it going. So we, it's so easy to miscommunicate. We really work on trying to get that improvement for all people. Again, thank you for attending. We hope you've enjoyed this series. And uh, I will say, since this is our last talk, uh, we will take credit for the weather being in the 40s and 50s next week. Thank you. All right. My microphone must be working now. They did have me cut off, didn't they? OK, so. Um, so I, I thought I'd come back to this map real quick. It was something that uh, we had been talking over my break over there. No, I'm kidding. Um, about our ancestral footprint on here. Uh, but we, no different than you know today, uh, enjoyed travels. Our, our men and our, our groups of people enjoyed you know, the waterways of old. You know? And um, just recently, in fact, <clears throat> in Madison, in Day Job, it made some local news uh, about this dugout canoe. Uh, that they had raised from the Lake Mendota over there. Um, and they had contacted all the tribes. And we, we are all busy. We were just constantly 24-7 now, uh, going, 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 you know, and trying to uh, assist, you know, other agencies, for example, uh, in, um, in collaborative efforts. And one of them ended up being this dugout canoe, you know, about the history of this and why they needed to raise it out of here uh, because of all the lake, the turbid waters on the lake now from boat traffic and whatever it was, they wanted to get this canoe out of the water. Uh, and they, 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 they used the term the shipwreck. Um, and, and so they, and they likened it to uh, this, you know, this sunken vessel, of course. And that when they raised it out of here, it made some news. <clears throat> I just so happened to get an email. I said, well, I'm passing through. Let me stop in there because the dugout, you know, uh, canoe in our history uh, plays a very pr prominent role. Ever since the last glacier period over here, you know, all the way up to present and hopefully in the future, we've had this extensive knowledge on, on how to make uh, water vessels, right? Uh, you'll hear about the Ojibwe's, how they make uh, birch bark canoes, you know, and um, you'll see some of those still being made. In fact, I have, a, I guess I'm a good friend. He still calls me by my first name. His name is Marv Defoe. Uh, and he built a dugout canoe and they took it over to Smithsonian and stuck it up in, in over there. Um, and because it's a lost, it's becoming a lost art. It's one of those things that we're seeing going the other way. 
You know, they know that within their generation or the next, they're not going to have any more birch in this area that suffices to make a dugout or a, a birch bark canoe. Can you imagine that, losing that part of your culture? Within my timeline here, we lost our black ash, emerald ash borer. Everybody knows that this bugs come through here and oh man, uh, the, the smart federal agency, they were putting all these little chemicals out in front of it there to see where they were. And basically there were hormones driving these bugs along, bringing them into our black ash communities. Now, I say that in part, but I, I totally don't understand some of the process we do. I mean, if you put you know, some, a, a hormone in front of these bugs out here to, to see where they're at, where they're gonna go to where they're at, right? That's just common sense, but we did that. We still do that. Um, but I'm not gonna say that's the reason. Um, this bug was decimating our, our ash in this area. One of them is the black ash. <clears throat> I mentioned earlier along these highways and byways of old, right? Where all the natives used to put in these basket stands. You hear about that? Well, those baskets that our women would make and the men would make the handles for them and they would go out there and collect the natural dyes on there. And you still find many of these black ash baskets that you hear of today and see it in your pawn shops or on people's shelves on there talking about the native history in this area on here. It played a very important role to our Ho-Chunk people here because that was one way that we generated enough money to get by through life. Like I said, we were subjected to some pretty, you know, um, interesting portions of history you know, here. Uh, not getting secular jobs would have been one of them, right? Uh, me, having, me having to go out there and pull moss. Not that, not that it was bad, it was good money. You know, but we didn't have much other than, you know, where we could put on this song and dance over there at Wisconsin Dells, right? The Stand Rock down there. We got together to visit and, and, uh, and, and enjoy our own personal time on there, but we also had to uh, in part, you know, some of our culture out there to generate money for the boating company, for example, and so on and so forth out there. So we got a little money back, so we can take it back into our community. We could buy blue jean material there to make pants so I go to school. You know, so it was a way that we were, you know, forced to figure outside the box in order to make money to that day. That's just the way, that's the way it's always been. Well, this black ash basket plays a very important role in our history because our women of old back in the 50s and 60s, they created this black ash basket cooperative where they would all make baskets and such and they'd bring them into this cooperative. Of course, they would kind of organize them and sell them and they'd get a cut of the money of the cooperative, but then the women would get money. And they had these black ash basket stands all along Highway 12, 41, all these highways there because this is where people would traverse before the interstate system, right? And this is, this is all of our history, it's kind of cool. And uh, you drive these old cars there and they'd overheat because the traffic was so slow down Highway 12, for example, between Minneapolis and Madison, Milwaukee, that cars that would overheat, they'd have to pull over. And us, I remember as a kid with my choka, you know, they'd make the black ash handles and stuff like that. But with the yellow banks, back black ash basket stand over there, uh, he'd make little bowls and arrows. He'd make flutes. You make all these different things over here, and that's where I gained a lot of my uh, memory is that having to sit there and put little piles of wood underneath his uh, fire out there so he could boil the water so he could stick these handles in there and steam that wood and bend them. You know, so that, all that stuff that I learned from there is something that I don't have to pass it on now because I now we're, we're living a different day and age, so I have to pass on stuff that's important today. Um, but that's one of the important things in my history right there that I talk about. And those black ash baskets played such an important role. And now we're losing all those trees. And so all these black ash baskets that you find, I shouldn't tell you this, because now you guys are gonna rush out and buy them, um, but they're becoming very valuable. And all of our ladies, they, if you look down the bottom, they write in the, with their, their little initials on there so that they would got paid, you know, where that basket was sold on here. So you find someone like Emma Big Bear, you know, or Thelma Lewis, or all these ladies that used to make baskets of old, they become treasured heirlooms to those family now. <clears throat> but we're lo losing that from this emerald ash bowl, this, this, this invasive bug that's coming here and destroying this process. Well, I'm gonna tell you, when I was talking to that Donald Blackhawk about those deers going the other way, that story was, at the end of that, that, well, he says, you know, we just gotta figure out what to use. You know, when, when the first pigs arrived here with the Germans and such down there, the, the Swedish people, and the Norwegians, 
the Germans, when they first came into this area here to harvest all this pine barrens in this area here, they brought all these new things on here and we adapted to use them. I mean, there's nothing wrong with putting on a pail of, you know, pork over here with corn and next to the deer or next to the beaver. It's just something that we're adapted to. And so when I mentioned that to Donald, he said, well, you know, if those deer go the other way, we'll find something else. No, there's no, nothing wrong with that process. He says, you know, everything is an invasive species. We stop to think about it. And we were standing there next to that van and he pointed over there in this person's yard, there was an apple tree. He says, at one time that apple tree come here, we found a use of it, right? It's a good food, makes great smoking material. He's, you gotta find what our mother gives us. There's just, that's all there is to it. Everything on this earth, as a purpose, we just have to figure out what it is. That's the key to that. <clears throat> and no different than here. When we used to travel up and down here, we took items of value up here. They didn't have down south, right? And vice versa. We brought our first corns back up here from the Cahokia area up here, and we planted our first corns in these raised garden beds in this area because you had to have find a way of adapting that corn to grow in here. And in order to get another month of year of growing, you use a raised garden bed concept, right? Frost falls down in the spring. And in the fall, two weeks on both sides, it's an entire month that your corn has the ability to grow longer with raised garden beds. And so that knowledge that we had to instill in amongst our people back in there, we still use it to this day. <clears throat> so anyway, talking about the footprint on here, up and down Nihate and all the tributaries that come in there on here, uh, we used to travel near and far, and I was mentioning to these ladies, uh, our nation purchased a property down there where the Lemon Wire River runs into the Wisconsin. Let me see if I can figure out the point. Right about in there. And it was such a value to us to have this rock art that was on this property here protected because it told a beautiful story, it tells a beautiful story into this day. In fact, that story needs to be, you know, encouraged to be told a little further now in our history. So it talks about our travels down uh, the Wisconsin into Nika, they all the way down to the Gulf. And on that rock art down here, they have this animal about the size of Oh, and a couple foot on here. And a lot of people thought it was a water spirit uh, right next to uh, what you can clearly see is a whale. Spout water coming out of it in there in Wisconsin, right on the rock art. It almost looks fake, right? But it isn't. It was this exploit of there's travels and all the way back and you should see all the different peoples and cultures that are carved into this rock of all the different people on here and all the stuff that they brought back on this rock art on here. It's a beautiful story. And our history needs to be extended on there of what we ran into now, right? That's my job. That's what I do for a living is I protect and preserve our culture and history. But my third P that I have to do is perpetuate. This is what I'm you know, instructed to do. The assumptions and duties I take from the SHPL, right? The State Historic Preservation Officer is to better protect and preserve our culture and, and, and tell it as we see fit. The perpetuation is the hardest part of doing that though. How do we pass this on? So guess what I get to talk about during the historic periods over here? I don't talk about you know, how the French came and how the British came, how the early Americans came in here. And oh, oh, by the way, over here is how these other tribes came in here, how sickness and disease, the land sessions, removals took place and how we were forced out of our state. This is the history that I have to pass on. Now our story's getting pretty again, this end over here, there's a lot of a lot of stuff that we still have to talk about in our history at least. And that's all of our history. You can tell that story. You guys can all make this rope, you know, and tell that whole story as you see fit. So anyway, so that's history 101, a little bit with that. Um, so I had, had to go all the way back to that one picture on here. But when she asked, you know, how far did we travel and establish ourselves? We've never moved from our footprint. We fought hard to stay within our ancestral footprint. And you always hear this, this misnomer that, oh, the Native Americans, whoa, they were nomadic. They lived hand to mouth. You know, they'd, they'd move from you know, this rock shelter over to this village and over there and so on and so forth. I just got done telling you, we preferred to come up into this area here for certain times of the year for certain luxuries that we couldn't get down our area. But we have always, always lived within our ancestral footprint. Never wanted to waver from it. We were not nomadic. We utilized our homeland. <clears throat> Talk about the whole chunk history here. Uh, when those black ash baskets were being sold out there, our women and our families, they decided that we needed to take advantage, you know, of what other tribes around us were already receiving as recognized sovereign nations of, of tribes. 
So what it was is on this here, I had it here, yeah. After the, you know, the British and the Americans got here, right here, um, after the dust clears out of here, uh, in the 1820s here, the US government was here as a territory, right? And they decided that, you know, well, we need to, you know, recognize the tribes, you know, so they began to create land session treaties, late treaties in short, where, you know, we had tribal leaders go and meet with, you know, different groups of, and, and with the government there and put X's on papers there stating, yeah, this is our boundaries and here's, you know, Ojibwe and the Menominee and who, whatever it was over here, and we'll stay on our side of the boundaries if you stay on yours and all, all, all would be good, right? They said they'd vow to, you know, punish any whites that would encroach upon our areas, vice versa. If we stepped across, you know, that figurative line, you know, there could be punishment on our end. Um, but there, the, the need for the discovery of the, the lead and the timber and the rich farmland in this area was really big. I mean, I don't know if they, when they were talking about these trees, in fact, they knew all along that those trees were going to be broke, broke, but they did. <clears throat> Oops, went the wrong way. So what happened then after the last treaty was signed with us on here, uh, a last acre was taken away from the Ho-Chunk to figuratively say on a piece of paper of all things that, you know, this is your land. Um, the removals began to take place. And like I mentioned, they took us to Turkey River. You know, all this is just basic history. You can go on the internet and find all this and look under Wisconsin, Winnebago treaties and the removals took place where they began to take us lock, stock and barrel. I don't, I don't know what that term is, must mean something. Um, but they hauled us to all these different places on here, uh, way up north. I like that agriculture that was king here, you cannot grow a stick of corn at that time to save your soul up in Long Prairie, Minnesota. You couldn't. And that, yet they wanted to put you on this reservation up there, right? And give you a couple locks and a blacksmith shop and say, there you go. You need to become you know, productive farmers here and assimilate into the American way or you're going to cease to exist. That's all there was to it. And it was, wasn't going to work. So this is where that dugout canoe comes into play. All along the Mississippi, right? They she ship, they call that Ho-Chunk bad water for us. Right off the door here to the south, down here, is a real deep portion of you know, Lake Michigan. And uh, I think you can look on it, and I don't know, maps now shows how deep it is, but that portion right on here used to always be a extra turbulent. And at one time we had sent warriors across, you know, Daishi Chick, you know, to, you know, battle against the Ottawa over there and a tempest or a storm come up here and we lost 500 warriors, dugout canoes, all gone, never come back. <clears throat> and so from that point on, you know, Daishi Shik always, you know, has this, you know, bad lake is what that means in Hotel. But anyway, so after we got done uh, signing all the treaties and the removals, they wanted to remove us from this area right here. And the last move that they did was Crow Creek, Minnesota, from that long prairie up there, that dugout canoe I was talking about there played a prominent role in us, that knowledge that our men had on here in order to make dugout canoes out of the cottonwoods and, and the pines and, and the, even the oak on here. Can you imagine making a dugout canoe with stone tools or metal tools there and oak? It's pretty tough, but they did it. Um, anyway, so they put all our young and our elders and our women in these dugout canoes and brought them back down the river and sought refuge in our ancestral homelands along the Mississippi. And this kept taking place and they'd gather us all up and haul them back up there and it wasn't working. So they decided to move us down to Blue Earth. And Blue Earth was good farmland, recently cut off by the pioneers or the early Americans on here. Uh, we have one story that talks about how, as far as you can look, you know, all the stumps of the trees were as high as of, of the men's breasts or women's breasts. That's how that, uh, you cut them off back then. Never cut them down that wide because then you'd have to cut that piece off again, right? So they always cut them that height and left them. Well, with that raised garden bed process, we had the knowledge to farm it. It was good soil, you know, it was really good soil. And so half of us decided that, you know, they wanted to stay there. The other half, we just didn't have enough room, you know, to practice our traditional ways of hunting and gathering. Um, and we didn't want to become that sedentary, you know, farmer out there. So there was a split and they, some of them wanted to come back and we began to come back to Wisconsin once again. Dug out canoes process, came back here. And the other half, you know, then of course, if you know history in Minnesota, I think it was 1863, I don't know if I had that date up here. Yeah, 
the Sioux uprising, they decided in Minnesota, lock, stock, and barrel is not going to be a native left in this whole entire state. So not only did they move the Sioux and, the, and try to get the Chippewa, but the Ho-Chunk, they rounded them up, Fort Snelling, took them up down with, you know, keel boats, all the way down and all the way up to Missouri for the most part, and took us all the way out to South, South Dakota. And in, in, in at uh, Crow Creek, South Dakota, if you, go, if you guys ever want to travel someplace and say, man, that was a stupid trip, that would be the one. There's nothing on why I shouldn't say that because some people might love it, but it was just, just dirt and rocks and tumbleweeds, nothing there, right? And, uh, but down in the bottom, the river bottoms, they had cottonwoods. And once again, we used those cottonwoods to great effect, dugouts and went down there. And half of our tribe sought refuge in Nebraska with Omaha people. When we were coming to the north, we had befriended the tribe out there. And uh, so when we broke away, they separated, we sought refuge with them. Half of our Ho-Chunk people still live out there to this day. The Winnebago tribe of Nebraska, they're called. The other half, why I'm standing here today, is my ancestors decided to come on back and we're back in Wisconsin yet. And uh, it's kind of funny, I shouldn't say funny, because it's sad. The Omaha went in for, in for, for uh, to allow the Ho-Chunk to stay there, Winnebago there, they talked to their agency down there, of course, and, and uh, government-wise, and they didn't give them land beside them as a reservation. They actually took some of their reservation away from them, not like they didn't have millions of acres out there, but gave some of their reservation away to place Ho-Chunk on there. It was kind of sad. <clears throat> but anyway, so. so long story short, those Trail of Tears we talk about right here, um, on here you'll see on this map, you know, our ancestral footprint. This is where we used to travel through this area. This area right here, we include in here because the Iowa and the Oto, right, Missouri, those tribes are Ho-Chunk people through and through, but they had recently broke away from us. And I have an uncle that talked about that. Uh, and he talked about the story of the Six Days Village, long story. But in short, uh, they had to break away from us and move across the Mississippi and travel six days. And, and so they lived in this area here uh, and so you still find them to this day, you know, scattered about there. I shouldn't say scattered, and that's where they prefer to live. But they have the whole chunk back, and when you talk to them, we talk about their history, their origin story, being a place called, of all places, Mogul Shoots. Same stories. And it's a beautiful story. In fact, as we have different functions on here now, I contact some of the tribes, and those, those are tribal government contacts, their tribal governments, and we invite them, and vice versa to include each other in the green corn dance, our powwows, and so on and so forth there. In fact, I shouldn't laugh about this, but recently they came to one of our powwows there and it was more of a formal you know, invite. They brought us a gift, it was something that we prefer not to use too much over here, but you accepted this gift. That gift of all things with a horse. They brought us a horse, nice gift. I said, we got to take care of the horse, right? <laughs> but we have tribal members that have stables and such like that. So it wasn't too big a deal. We just had to figure out how to do it. <clears throat> and so, because they're, they've adopted, you know, adapted out there and utilized horses to great effect. We didn't need horses over here. We had our beautiful waterways, right? We have all the, if you would Im, impose uh, our trails in this area on here, it was just a beautiful maze of how we would get from point A to point B. You know, through our many villages and our cultural sites and the experiences our families would utilize to travel, you know, uh, from our sugar bushes in the spring, you know, this up here, the late sugar bush takes place here, right? You guys are like two weeks, you know, after us. So we could sugar bush all, all the way from, you know, the, the waterways all the way up here and sugar bush for a good month, you know, that's a lot of sugar, you know. You know so, so you just, that's the way it would work. But anyway, so, this ancestral footprint is, um, is something that we always hold near and dear to our hearts. You know, and that's what we protect and preserve. Now, as I meet to protect cultural resources, it's unfortunate because now, instead of not only having to protect burial sites, for example, one example, or cultural resources of this area from a, a project, for example, um, I, I also have to include the routes that they took us, either by rail or by keelboat and or by forced marches on here. If there's projects that are taking place, even way out there along the Missouri and Crow Creek, South Dakota, because 
along those routes, we lost, I think on this, just the removal from Blue Earth all the way over to uh, Crow Creek over there, we lost about 1,600 individuals, tribal members. Um, and you, you can find this in, information in, in a lot of the documents, you know, that the, uh, the military would take. I don't know what they call them, commanders or whatever. They'd have to document all they did. And, and anyway, so, but the stories are just ugly. Anyway, so, so now the Corps of Engineers project who has a dam on that river over there, for example, wants to drop the water lift table down uh, four or five feet down here. Guess what I have to go and do? I have to go and tell the Corps, you need to do your due diligence out there. And when you drop that water down on here, we have not ancestors that are, you know, makeshift graze around on there. You need to protect those from these looters, these weekend, you know, treasure hunters that love to go along the shorelines and collect all these beautiful stones and oh, beadwork. There's Indian jewelry and stuff like that. I wonder where that come from, right? Well, it's from my ancestors that are buried alongside the river here. So anyway, so not to get all, you know, saddy. But anyway, so they, there was a change in the air. 1800s took place. Uh, they allowed us now to live in amongst the Wisconsin area. We weren't really citizens. I think I mean, we were going to wars. We fought in wars right alongside other peoples, you know, all through the years, right alongside the Americans out there. And we were never, I don't think we were even recognized as citizens until I think it was 1924. It's when natives were first recognized as we still can vote, you know, but, but as American citizens. But anyway, homesteads were gifted back to us, some of our land throughout our footprint. Uh, we, we decided since uh, other tribes in the 30s were gaining their sovereign, you know, recognition on here and establishing governments, we needed something of that nature. And so that's where it came, 63. And anybody here, I don't want to show a hands, how many here was, was, more, was alive in 63, right? That's when our tribal government was established. So it's not that old. We, in fact, not so, so a few years ago, we had our 50th anniversary as a tribal government. So we're pretty young at this process here, actually. Uh, anyway, so in 94, we realized that, you know, our, when we first established our government, did I just have a picture of that? Yeah, we, we were so assimilated in our mindset and all those documents that were signed way back then in these treaties that said the Winnebago tribe, Winnebago people, Wisconsin, Winnebago this, Winnebago that. So in order to establish and be recognized to form a government, we had to be recognized as the Winnebago tribe of Wisconsin, the Winnebago nation. <clears throat> and in 94, we transformed to what we call ourselves now, the Ho-Chunk people, Ho-Chunk nation of Wisconsin to differentiate us from the Winnebago tribe in Nebraska, who are still Ho-Chunk through and through, but they had to create their own form of government out there. And they still are, even though they're our brothers and sisters and relatives directly, uh, they have their own form of tribal government out there. Okay, after three, I want you to say Ho-Chunk. One, two, three, Ho-Chunk. Okay, so now you use just spoke Ho-Chunk. Because when you say Ho-Chunk, what you meant was people of the big voice. And what you're basically saying is the people of the first voice, people of the sacred language that has always been spoken in this area since time immemorial. It's interesting because I say it a lot and it doesn't mindset am I that I'm saying that. I always say Ho-Chunk because I work for a tribal government for some reason, it just doesn't settle in. <clears throat> okay. And then the, somebody had asked, well, where, when you say you know, that the glaciers affected us, what did it affect? It did affect this area and the glacier lobe. And this is that driftless area that you hear so many people talk about in tourism. That actually is what we're talking about, a place of refuge. This is where the Ho-Chunk people uh, had resided. This here, this glacier lake that was created here, right here that pinched the water coming off here for a period of time here, when this receded out here, and that deluge or gully used to Devil's Lake area and around the Devil's area there began to occur. Uh, that soundscape and that viewscape was so great. We still talk about that in our history. <clears throat> Wisconsin River, this is where that Nuhma Ruhani Chate, everybody probably say that in their sleep tonight. Uh, that was there, right down in there. But to, to witness that on these valleys and ridges up here, Kickapoo Valley Reserve, I think our tribe has 1,200 acres of that reserve down there. And um, Many of these stories are very beautiful and be able to tell them real time. Looking from this valley down here, this story took place all oh, so many years ago. You know, it's kind of fun to do. Talking about, you know, this period up here. You know, 
and how it changed and transformed for us as a people. We still talk about it as red banks, um, but there's little remnants of it left. But the place is still there. So that, that history there is real beautiful. And here's that lake I was talking about on Dells when it created that big deluge and dark carved that out through that rock down there. Okay, so, so we're getting closer to the end. How much time do we have? Five minutes, then question and answers. That's great. Uh, so hopefully I touch base a little bit about, you know, our extensive footprint and where we prefer to live, but we love to travel a lot, no different than today. You know, I, does anybody geocache in here? Geocaching is just going around. There's, it's like a treasure hunt where you're, you actually are, you know, the, the person looking for it. Well, anyway, so here's an image out here. Again, just not a picture image. It's a random story of how life actually, you know, uh, was in part like, you know, uh, family dwelling, you know, uh, how you learned back there was in that family dwelling. When I said Jack and Jill and that Chipotle cave, that tent that she was talking about over there, in the winter time is when we would pass on our history and knowledge and teach our young. And our family setting would be our grandparents, right? And our parents and, and our youth, right? Our kids and grandkids. And of, of our grandparents who were our instructors, our teachers, the wise ones, right? Would talk across the fire to our youth over there. Jack and Jill went up the hill. I'm trying to act old. To fetch a Ford, right? Well, I growing up being, you know, battered with Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water would stop Choka. Choka, no, that's not how that story goes. When we learned it, Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. Well, when Choka would say, oh, yes, that's right. Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. And our youth, for four months, three months in a Chipotle, tied down to the poles almost, right? Hearing stories constantly, but remember, Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch that pail of water. <clears throat> and that's how you pass on history right there, redundancy. Another way is through our songs, right? When you sing, I, I'm not going to sing here, to tell you the truth. I don't know if I can sing, but... Um, but if I sing a song from memory on here, that never changes, right? That song could be passed on for 50 years, and those words will be the same. The song is sung. You know, our clans all sing their own songs. You know, our men and women sing their own songs, and our children learn those same songs, and in those stories are engraved, you know, our history and our culture, our way of life, they say. And that's how you pass on history. When you walk up to that stone, when Jim Funmaker took us over to the White House Rock, and he was talking about know a certain story there's one stone this this is a beautiful area on this rock and he can't barely reach it anymore because the soil had eroded away but he when he was younger there was this groove and a smaller groove and a smaller groove and all of these animals that are no longer here and these plants that are no longer here and these animals right here that was on the stone over here he was talking about as he grew up he was taken to that stone there and it was showing the recession of that glacier and all the animals that were leaving and these new ones coming on here and that stone is still tells that exact same story, exact same story. And it doesn't change, right? I said our, our language is written in stone. And so those, those areas there are real beautiful, you know, areas to share with our children, share with you folks, right? But this is the life of old. This is no different than today. You know, folks are coming. We had food. Every time somebody comes here, you always offer them a little food and water, right? And our kids are playing around. That's just kind of life. Talk about those tents, you know, the Chipotle caves, the round dwelling. So how do you say, you know, a, a native dwelling, right? So the teepee, right? Suin, Western, right? Wigwam, everybody hears about wigwams. That's a Jibwin. No, Chipotle, I just got to mention in Chipotle, it means round dwelling in Ho-Chunk, wiki ups. What do you call a dwelling like this today in the English language? A house, right? Home, there you go, easy. So when we talk about the Chipotle, this is where our knowledge is passed on. I got the fire here. They say our fire is something that's living, you know, it's sacred to us. You know, when you speak across a fire, you're supposed to speak only the truth. You know, no lies can be told. You know, and, and so these are modern renditions. Here's a, this is actually a photo now. Um, lodge or Chipotle, 
a chipotle with canvas with a stovepipe, uh, squared ch chipotle over here as a home. The progression of how we had transformed or adapted, you know, in one of our housing sites, for example. You know, that's just the way it works. Truth be told, a lot of our elders said this was the most comfortable, most healthy way of living right there. It's practical, small, you know, easy to heat. Everything was in there and more. And once you got into that big square home over here, they were very impractical, hard to heat back then, right? Always constantly going, going, going to repairs. That lady that I told you put that food spread on for us on here, uh, they lived in the Chipotle for pretty much all her life, right up until uh, they built a home, I think it was like in the, like 2005 or 2008, someplace in there. They finally built themselves a home. And they preferred it. They liked it. Yeah. <laughs> That's probably Door County. Look at there. Look at your snow. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so this is how you get by through life, right? All of us has this somewhere in our history, even today. Our tribe is comprised of clans here. This is a poor rendition of our our how we've got through the eons and time, because this really, in order to tell this story, it has to be up against the wall. But it, so there is no, even though we say upper clans and lower clans, this should be flat on the floor and all the clans looking to the center collectively. So we all have our own equal roles, uh, our duties and responsibilities of clans. You know, and so the, the processes for us to be, to go through eons and times is that your clans are very important to get you through, no different than Fish Creek, right? Or Egg Harbor over there. They got their, they got their police, they got, they got their judicial systems, you got your sanitary processes, you got your state DNR. Take one of them away, take your police away, take the Bear Clan away here, and it becomes dysfunctional. It's hard to do, so you have to have that process. Cities have it, municipalities, the states have it, local municipal people have it. You have to have a, a process. And this is how you get through the ends of time. You rely on the others because you can't do it alone. You can't lone wolf it out there. I mean, Jeremiah Johnson can. I take that back. But after Jeremiah Johnson, there's very few people that can live out there, you know, successfully out there. You have to rely on other people. So our families take care of themselves. Our clans take care of themselves. Our kinship roles take care of us. All these things that gets you through life. And then you have to pass it all on effectively so that they don't lose their way. And our tribe was so devastated to the, you know, the simulation process, you know, trying to put it on reservations. And along with those reservations, you know, came boarding schools or Christian schools, trying to teach our children. They didn't know how to vaccinate us back then. You know, where's that mask of mine, right? So they made our kids, all of them, you know, gathered together when small, smallpox was going there because it was, they were bent on teaching us Christianity. And all of our kids would get smallpox. And we had all these common graves of old, you know, the smallpox and diphtheria, no different than everybody else on here. But we had, we had no immune system to that process there. But it didn't matter. We wanted to teach our children. So I, I could just do a PowerPoint alone on boarding schools. In fact, I think for the DOT or some other state agency recently, four of us tribe, five of us got together. We thought, oh, spoke specifically on um, boarding schools, you know, and Indian uh, uh, mission schools and farm schools and so on and so forth. And the, the devastation, it still affects us to this day, that process there. <clears throat> Fire's life, I'll say, so Snow Snake. If anybody follows social media at all, if you friend me on Facebook on there, you'll see that uh, Snow Snake is making a resurgence in, in, uh, uh, in, in the tribal communities. And we've been taking this to different areas. Madeline Island recently had a snow snake event up there. And you are looking at the elder winner of the snow snake. Um, so so they, they broke them up in uh, age groups over there. I think it was zero to 12 and then 13 to whatever it was, whatever it was. And uh, so and I totally could have beat them all. I could have told. Anyway, so um, it was a big sweep, in fact, up there. We took enough Ho-Chunk people up there that uh, the women's group won Ho-Chunk. You know, the young youth group, Ho Chunk, uh, the, the uh, I don't know what it, what, what it was to 54. He won, luckily, but he did it. I videoed that. It was the funniest video in the whole world. And then from 55 on up till, you know, you know ever, uh, I ended up winning that one too. So it was a Ho Chunk sweep down there for the most part. Yay, way to go, right? 
And, uh, well, I'll tell you what, you want to see some competition. You, there was four different tribes from four different states, I think, more tribes than that from four different states coming there because it was just a nice gathering to get outside and do something outside again. And a lot of people think, well, in the winter months, man, what, how did you guys get through life, right? Well, we played all the time. We made enough food in the summer and the fall and prepared it in order to get us through not only the winter and the spring, but we did it in great multitude. And that's what our dunes are for, right? Feed, the, feed those that are less fortunate. So they have gatherings, put big, big feeds on in the winter, the spring you know, months, they do the same thing. After the spring sugar bushing, everybody separate to do that. But come the gardening and the fall harvest and preparing for the next winter and life was good. You know, so tobogganing, right? There's a lot of things that we could do back then. I want to only go into the plants. I only had four minutes, five minutes ago. Um, so, but what, what I was trying to show through this area right through here is that, you know, we were, we were not in lack of having something to do, right? All our children did it. That must mean, that's, that's being good off the stage. So, um, but life, life, you know, for the whole chunk people, um, although we have adapted and changed and we live in today's society, you know, we always look towards the stuff that, uh, uh, the perpetuation of our culture and our, and our history and our heritage. Um, and we've never been one not to share. You know, a lot of people say, oh, the tribes are so guarded. Well, you got to come and ask. You know, don't sit there and look at a few stones and some potter here and try to tell us how our life and culture was on here because it'd be no different than going into your kitchen, taking some of your finest china that you got from another country, taking it in the backyard and smashing it up and grinding it in the dirt, then have somebody come over there and dig up your backyard and tell you about your own religion, your preferences of life, your relatives, how you, how you live there, how long. That's what it's like to us. You know, come and ask. That's all you got to do. Okay? Hope that archaeologist left. No. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. So, and that's, I guess, all I have at this time. Any questions? Thank you so much. <laughs> We will take your questions, but first I want to thank all of you for coming today, especially those of you who have been with us um, two, three, four uh, days this winter. We appreciate you. We appreciate the support of UWGB and their First Nations program, as well as Door County Civility Project. And um, I also want to put in a little plug. I hope to see many of you here back in two weeks. Um, actually, two weeks from yesterday, we present Nobuntu. So we'll be taking a little Zimbab a trip to Zimbabwe right here in Fish Creek. Many of us haven't been able to travel internationally, so we're bringing um, some voices from Zimbabwe here. Nobuntu, that's <clears throat> Friday, um, March 25th. Thank you so much, Mr. Quackenbush. I also want to say, share that um, he graciously provided us with his PowerPoint presentation, which you can find that on our Facebook page. Um, and if you aren't on Facebook, you can go to dcauditorium.org and there's a link there where you can download the PDF slides to, to um, study further or anything you didn't hear today. We have one question here. Hello. Um, can you share with us your, the creation story of the Ho-Chunk? <clears throat> yes, I can. Um, so there's several different uh, versions of the process. Each. Uh, uh, each clan effectively can uh, tell their own version of that story, obviously. Um, I could put it in a nutshell. Um, and I, I basically did tell it is that at one time, you know, our, our creator who has made all, called Maona, maker of all, right, made the earth. Um, and he had formed, you know, the earth and put all the animals on it. And, and the last creature that he had made is Ho-Chunk in our story. And that there was um, little of any gift to give back other than what he had given to the other animals, right? You know, the wolf, the, the proudness, and the expertise of being able to work together, you know, to receive, a, you know, uh, an objective, hunting, for example, or for war, you know, or, uh, or um, other different animals on the earth there. They are all gifted something that, they, that we recognize them for, right? You know, the, the eagles or thunders with long eyesight and so on and so forth. But for man, he had nothing left. And so what he'd gifted us at that time was something that the archaeologists should be very interested in this. Um, he gifted this one plant, Don E, right, tobacco. And that uh, we had the ability to utilize and grow tobacco, you know, to place it uh, when we see fit 
you know, down and ask for direction or guidance or whatever we feel we need to um, talk to our creator. We utilize tobacco for that process. And by doing that, all the other animals uh, become envious of this and, 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 they, and they become subjects to us. Uh, and so uh, where he placed us, uh, where we were formed, was a place called Mogashuch, right in this area here. And this is what we always ancestrally call as our a place of origin in this area. And those stories go back, you know, since the last two glacier periods. And uh, she had asked over here, Christine and, and several others here, well, how long ago was that? I had the 12,000 year rope on here and that was that last glacier episode. And there was another glacier before that, you know, and I think that if I'm not, you know, if I'm correct, it's 20 some thousand years ago, you know, that, that first glacier episode had taken place. <clears throat> and so that is the story that in short, that, that we talk about is our, our origin and our history uh, is firmly within this ancestral footprint right here. And so, say for the Menominee and, and the Ojibwe and Otto and all these other tribes, you know, that it came through um, at different times, through periods of time, we have beautiful stories about our first interaction with them. Menominee, we call them Kaki, right? Uh, the raven. And it's a real beautiful story. It talks about when... Uh, at one time, you know, they, our uh, ancestors were sitting on the shores of Mogoshuch and they looked off, you know, to across the lake. They saw what they, they, they saw. They saw what they thought uh, were uh, these ravens that were coming towards, you know, their village. And uh, it was during the period of time in the morning, and you can't, you know, differentiate between, you know, the smooth water and the rising sun behind there. There's just no difference. And what it was, was uh, these groups of individuals coming along the shoreline there with their canoes. And their oars were glistening in the sun as they were paddling, and it looked like it was the wings coming. And when they first interacted with the Ho-Chunk, uh, they grew fearful, and uh, they beached their crafts, and they hid amongst the trees. And our men were sent over there to welcome them into the village. You know, and, and that process that took place there they were allowed to stay at the river that they you know, call themselves up there in the river now. And that is the place that they felt is their origin site right there. And that's how our first uh, connection with the Menominee people took place. Well, this story can be told of the Jibwins coming, you know, the Sioux people. You know, that six days village story is where we also separated into groups, you know. So the progression of our origin and a progression of how we were interacted with different groups and cultures of people. You know, we have a beautiful story that talks about the Swedes, believe it or not, over in Jackson County. Very laborious, strong people that would put the rails in. And even along the old rails where they would harvest, you know, uh, all the mar mar muck and stuff to build this rail up here to put the ties in here to harvest the logs in the, that big pine barren on here, those holes that go along those roads to this day, we call them Swede holes. And it's a terminology the loggers of old used to call sweet holes on here. And there was a camp in our area they called Zita, you know, um, pine, the pine, pine village or pine camp. And that area right there, the Ho-Chunk that, you know, knew that area down here, there was a group of Swedes over there too. And Bohemians and the Swedes can party, I kid you not. You know, because those guys are always look forward to going there. Once a month they'd go to some town hall or some camp or something like this. And they always either go to the Bohemians because they preferred that and or the Swedes on here because there's a lot of good stuff that goes on at those camps on there. So how do we segue into that? I don't know. I had to say that though because I wanted to make sure she knew that. So another question. Yep. Uh, who have stories related to the site that's now called Bajtama? Eslam? Uh, sure. Oh, yes. Um, I'm assuming that the... I'm assuming that there were boarding schools that um, the Ho Chunk children were taken to. Could you talk about that a little bit? Yes, yeah. Um, for my part, I talk a little bit about Ho Chunk specific. <clears throat> so there's uh, several types of schools. Uh, boarding schools is kind of a nutshell grab of uh, industrial schools for natives, mission schools for natives. Um, uh, boarding schools is a real clean way of stating this is where 
they forcibly took our children and placed them there and tried to teach them, you know, a different belief and culture and and some of that reading, writing, and, and arithmetic stuff's on here, but oh my goodness, so much more. Uh, they were nothing more than um, new slavery. All the local farmers down at Toma, for example, at Toma Industrial School, they totally, they, rare did they work and learn something when farming was had because the local farmers utilized our youth, right? Wittenberg's up there. I think it was called Bethany School up in that area. Um, same thing. I mean, at every one of these schools, we would use, use, lose them, you know, life, their lives there, and they would bury them on site, not even tell their parents. You now, Bethany has burials up there. Indian boarding schools has, you know, down in the industrial park, now Toma has, you know, remains buried there. And they, those are our Ho Chunk youth in these areas here. And the VA sits on the one in Black River, or Toma, for example. And they hardly recognize that. They don't even really want to even kind of find where they're at so that. They have a stone that has in memory of the, you know, native that, you know, came to school here. Never really says that, oh yeah, by the way, right off on the stone out here, you know, there's half a dozen or more Ho-Chunk youth or youth out here that are buried here, you know, and, and it will happen time and time again. And I think, how many schools I think in Wisconsin, was there eight or something like that or 11? I, I can't remember how many schools there were on here, but the ones that, you know, I did some research on out there, it was just travesty after travesty after travesty. And yet then um, I found this one written essay or article over here where somebody interviewed some of our tribal members, um, Larry Garvin and Sadie Finishy, you know, and about their experience of learning at the mission school in Black River and then going into the stark reality of having to go to, uh, not having to, we're going to Black River High School and the stark contrast in the learning processes up there. And how comfortable it was, and how uncomfortable it really was, you know. And they're—they're, they're, you know, I shouldn't say their age, but they're elders, you know. But um, but they had an an affectionate, you know, memory of the process, because this is where they could be around their friends, and this is where they could learn. And so there was a lot of a wide array of thought on on boarding school mentality. I always look at you know what I have to protect and preserve on a preservation level. Um, but there's many stories out there, and then to top it off. Uh, we had a teacher, high school teacher, I think his name is Paul Ricken. Ricken's, I think his, either as his father or his real, real close relative, he ran the Bethany School up there. And so that's why he had such a keen interest in telling the story accurately. And so he developed in Black River High School there, the ability to teach a, a whole, I think it was a quarter or a half, or whatever it was there, some curricula regarding Ho-Chunk history specific, including the board, boarding school process up there. And he would call us, I think, annually. In fact, since the, before the pandemic hit here, I actually had to take the youth, his group out there, once a year to another cultural resource site so that they get some field experience of uh, how Ho-Chunks really live. You know? And it, it was real interesting because he had a, a kindred you know, interest in the process because he had relatives directly involved with the boarding school and he wanted to make sure that the story is told accurately, not, not to clean it up, tell it accurately, which was really nice of him. So. Bill, yes. we have a question here from the live stream on Facebook. Oh, yeah. It's um, Sandy Brown asks, how far back do two spirit go in your history? Boy, that that is a good question. You know, I, I'm going to go out on a limb and state that there has always been ever since man has been here, you know, um, the need to recognize, you know, people's lifestyles and beliefs, no matter what it is. And whether it was spoken of formally or if it was addressed formally or not, there's no recognition to that really. Even to this day, uh, they say they carry two spirits in them. It makes them stronger, makes them unique, actually, even in, in, in tribal culture. And that it's like, and, and it, it's not a rare thing even in any culture out there, you know. Um, I, I talk about a period of time up here that our oral history and how strong it is, you know, how we, we try to protect our history through an oral traditional way yet, because we don't rely on the electronic processes here to pass on our history and our culture, and we don't rely on the written language over here uh, to tell our history and culture in books, because not so long ago, right, 1940s, on the other side of this earth over here, there was one group of people hell-bent 
on trying to wipe off several other people groups off the face of the earth. And the first thing they did was rounded them up and separated their men and their women and children, right? And took all their literature that they had and everything that had anything of their value. They put them in the streets and they burned those books. You know, they were trying to get rid of that history for there. And so we re always refer upon our oral history on here. And yet you'll see telltale signs even within the process of culture, how it has adapted in here. This period of time here where those effigy mounds were being placed on here. Our great interaction with, of all people, what this guy was referring to, do you have any knowledge about Aslan down here during this period of time here, about this great fort work that was taking place along this river, you know, over here, north of a, another, you know, process down there from Cahokia, right, and uh, Tremplo and all these other footholds that this other process or culture was coming into this area here. And I'm gonna go out on a limb and tell you this period of time here when they realized that this wasn't doing us any good on here and they severed that process, we don't do that anymore. And we're getting back to more of a traditional 12 clan process of perpetuating us, that was big. But in that mound system process on here, See, I was trying to get to something. Uh, I had several people refer to a mound system in close proximity in the Madison area here. They called it a two-spirit mound. And uh, they, archaeologists will always refer to it as a turtle mound, double-tailed double spirit mound. Or this bird over here has a split tail over here. And what they're referring to is in some you know, circles, they talk about these mounds that were representing two spirits. And I mentioned that one time to the University of Madison on their property that they manage, there's this two-spirit mound up there that some have referred to on there. And that, so that history could matter of factly be placed um, in, in a physical form on the ground out there. Whether it is the case or not, I don't know. But you know, uh, that question is interesting though, that, that how far back does that go? It doesn't really matter how far back it goes. It's just so that it's recognized and you know, and if people prefer one way form another, who are we to say, right? You know, I don't tell everybody, you know, you know, my processes in life, you know, when it comes to personal stuff like that, and nobody should question it. You know, so that's it. Any other questions? Did that answer your question? Asalan. Dave? Uh, and so Asalan falls upon uh, an area that's very unique to us. It's in a transitional area here. It's an area where a lot of the tribes from the east were coming around the Deshi Shik I was telling you about here and asking and seeking and counsel, you know, for whatever it was on here, uh, seek refuge, uh, passage through, uh, interaction. And that always happened along the Mississippi too and along the river systems on here. People are coming up here. I mean, look at, look at Lewis and Clark. Guess what they had to do when they were going up Missouri River? They had to go oh, send somebody ahead of them and beseech, right? And Sacagawea, you know, kind of a voice and all this other stuff. And Asalon's no different, you know? Let's create, you know, a process there where we have a place to meet the council, right? It doesn't mean they're, they're staying there. That means nothing, you know? It's just a way that they did on here. But that culture that took place on here became very, you know, adversely affecting us as a people and culture, and it ceased to exist. We have, Several stories that talks about the demise, if you want to call it that, um, of that culture in this area here. Uh, we prefer not to talk about it, uh, but that very individual I was talking about, that Jim Funmaker, he would pass on several stories about that period of time in our history down there. And it's something that we hold near and dear to heart. It's not very pretty. Um, it takes, takes you right back to a period of time way back in there. I had that one ribbon over here. It talks about, the, and you always hear this secular and tribal culture, the legend of Red Horn, you know, this battle of these giants, you know, and these, you know, how we join forces with other people around us in order to thwart these efforts of these large individuals, these red haired giants. And that's a beautiful story. It's all symbolic and it's all, you know, it's not something I would say is, you know, very physical or, but that story's in our history there, a period of time there. And to be able to tell that up here, you know, is, 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 it transcends into a period of time that if they ever run into this situation ever again in the future on here, you should be able to learn from what worked and didn't work. And the stories that we hold that are sensitive to us about that period that worked and didn't work is something that we'll have to pass on. Well, I wonder if you could take just a little more time.
time to explain about Silver Mound and that Hickson oh, yeah. chert and how important that was as a trade item uh, for the Ho Chunk. Yeah, and so it's a it, it's a quartz. Um, it's a very preferred tool. Um, archaeologists from afar will come up there, and, and I don't think they're supposed to be doing it legally, but they'll come and take some of that back because um, that hill's big, I guess, to them, and they can take material back because they love putting out workshops on how to do napping and so on and so forth. So, but slowly, we're losing, you know, material up there, and it, it it has played a role in our culture and history ever since time of memorial, since the last glacier period before that, right there. And the stone tool is one of those preferred tools that were easier than working with, you know, a, 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 any other stone out there. And so it was very valuable to us. So when you find these blanks, these caches of stone, you know, underneath a stump when a farmer plows over a new field over there, those caches of stones were what were being hauled up and down the river systems on here because it was such a highly valued material of old over here. And now, unfortunately, the worst thing that we have is this right here and that you can go on there and eBay, you can buy a, a Hickston quartzite stone. And that stone could be in Japan tomorrow. You know, and so that stone doesn't tell you a very good story anymore about our footprint, you know, unless that, you know, the archeologists over there, they, they determine that, you know, this was found on the ground and they document and document, document now too. But Hickston quartzite is just one of the many things from the Wisconsin region, you know, that was highly valued back then. I mean. Take yourself some sugar candy from your area here, some maple candy down there to Missouri down there, and it's highly praised even to this day. Those things there that we have in here, you know, is what we hold near and dear to our heart. None of us would be here, right? You know, you know, they call it God's country for a reason, I think, you know, and I'm sure everybody living here all over the world says this is God's country too, but this is the, and where else are you going to have four beautiful seasons, right? I mean, right time I get sick of winter, summer's there. Right? Or winter or spring, and vice versa. It's a really beautiful area to go too. So now I'm probably picking on a lot of uh, bluebirds out there. But, uh, okay, one more question over there. I'll touch base on that if you need a little bit. Do you do you know any uh, traditional uh, Ho Chunk songs on the Native American flute? On the flute? On the flute, yes. I oh, saw you had the flute. Yeah, I grew up with this thing in my hand. <laughs> uh, yeah, so yeah, I do. Um, we have um, a series of songs that I use, you know, for different stories and such. <clears throat> this flute oh. right here, mm -hmm. and I, I don't want to get too overdrawn on time here. Oh. Uh, this flute here is actually one that I copied my, my choka. I was telling you that it would sit on the side of Highway 12 there and make me feed the fire so we could bend stuff. We also made flutes, little bows, back scratchers and everything. We had a flute much the same way as this one, not a sumac. Same length and everything. I just kind of remembered it off memory of how to did it. So I decided, well, I'm going to go out and make myself a flute. I didn't have his flute. So I thought I'd go make the flute. Uh, ends up being this piece of sumac on here. This is the way it looked right there. And, and his was a six finger hole flute, you know. And uh, he'd play it every once in a while, but not really that often. He would just make them because along the roadside, I mean, the kid, you know, would buy a bowl for a buck. You know, with a little couple arrows, they probably snap it by the time they got to the end of where they're going in the back of the car. But the flutes are bought by some men because they're courting flutes, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a beautiful story that comes with everything we do. Um, so back in, I think it was 2000 and, I don't know, 2015, um, there was this young, very energetic third grade teacher at Lincoln Elementary in Madison. And uh, she had asked me, it was the time of year in the fall, you know, when Indian Awareness Month takes place, where this is the one month of the year you get to learn Native stuff. And, and uh, so we're running like with chickens with their heads cut off. Uh, I'm getting many emails. And uh, so I get an email from this lady, her name is Emily. And she said, hey, can you, uh, we're studying Native American culture. Uh, we're a unique school there. We're, we're kind of like a, a multi uh, uh, lingual or multi uh, uh, group type school uh and uh, I, could you come down here and speak there's a couple of ho chunk in here it'd be nice to learn about how oral history works why do you prefer to use oral history uh, to hang on to your culture 
I said, yeah, I, I guess I can. I says, get a hold of me next week, and I'll, if I'm passing through in Madison, I'll stop in for an hour, and I'll talk a little bit about oral history. And I always use PowerPoints. I got, I think, 35, 40 PowerPoints. And I, so I dug one out there, talked about oral history, the significance and use of it there. And so I, I talk about it. Oral history is passed on. This is why we utilize it. This is how easy you can lose, use it. Here's some oral stories on the end. I, I've had these three photos up here. Uh, one talks about Kuniga and, and, and the aspect of the birch and how they received its little eagle marks, right? Um, uh, over on this side over here was a picture of, I think I had over here. So that was the Kunuga over here. This over here tells this other story. But then this story over here had a flute, this flute, a, a guy playing a flute actually. And through the whole class down here, I was using this flute to point. And so every time I waved it around like this, all those kids were like, wow. And I didn't think about that. And so I said, well, at the end, I said, I can tell you one of these stories real quickly before I leave. And so you have to practice exactly what we've been saying on here, that there's two different things, right? There's hearing and there's listening. You have to listen. Because hearing is one ear and out the other. Listening is taking it in and retaining something from that, right? And there's two sides to oral history, me telling it and you hearing it and taking it or listening to it. So anyway, so I told those kids that there and they said, oh, yeah, okay. And so she could, is it okay if I record the story? I go, yeah, you can record the story. <clears throat> and it was that time of year where, you, you know, that's not a big deal at all. And so she um, recorded it. And I told the whole story. It takes about 10, 12 minutes to tell the story of how the Ho Chunk acquired and the, the Ho Chunk courting flu. And uh, two weeks later, I was just totally like, I forgot who she was. I forgot the kids and everything. She contacted me again. She goes, oh, that story that we recorded is okay if we uh, uh, use it to write a book. And I said, well, yeah, sure. Uh, what, what story was that again? And I didn't know. She goes, oh, about the fluid. I recorded you. Oh, I said, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll go ahead. That's okay. It was something my choka passed on to me. When I was a kid growing up, you'd hear this story about the fluid. So then, uh, <laughs> so she got a hold of me the next week. Because, yeah, my, my students, uh, third grade students, they drew pictures of the story for how it, you got the flu. 23 pages of pictures students drew. I go, that's pretty cool. She goes, it is okay if we put it in Spanish, you know, make it a bilingual language book. I go, I said, um, I, it'd be fine, I says. And Emily, I said, that's perfectly fine. I says, but I'd prefer if you told it in Ho Chunk. I mean, it's a Ho Chunk story. Why don't you work with our language class, or student, your language um, division there and get the story told in Ho Chunk and put that in the book. She goes, oh, that's a great idea. So a while ago, a month after that, midwinter after that, I got a hold, got a hold from Emily again. She goes, Mr. Clackenbush, you know, I got a hold of the language out of Nakusa. They worked with their youth over there. We had the, the language transcribed. The whole story is written in Ho Chunk, Spanish, and English. Not only that, we put, we said like that, they're told with pictures on the side of, of each story page. I go, well, that's amazing. That's pretty cool. Then she goes, I would like to get it audio taped, you know, and put them on QR codes in that. I said, well, let's do that. I said, that'd be really cool. So she ended up getting a hold of Elliot Garvin, myself, a Spanish speaker. And uh, we sat in this little sound room in our language division. And sure enough, uh, Elliot, you know, Garvin, he, he reads it and speaks it eloquently. He read the whole story. And uh, she, she read it in English. And uh, the Spanish lady, she read, read, read it in, in Spanish. And, uh, and they even had me play the flute. When, and in the story, you have to play the flute. And so anyway, so when the story took place, she wrote the book. And she just wanted to use it for her district there, pass it around. And so she ended up, I, she says, well, is it okay if we uh, print this out, publish it? I go, yeah, you can totally publish it. In fact, I have a grant. Let me buy it from you. I says like that, I'll publish it. And I'll have that book. And even though you did the majority of the work, she goes, oh, no, you did all the work. It's your story. It's your book. So I ended up buying her book from her there. And we still hand it out as an instructional learning tool based off this one little clue right here. Too. And so do you need that story? I didn't think so, because it takes 10 to 12 minutes. And, and so that story goes, you know, basically in Madison or where it is there, 
Kunugo travels to the north to follow this great white deer he's been instructed to do. Uh, he travels to it three days there, uh, gathers the flute, learns how to make it, learns how to play it, and he comes back there to win over, of all things, his heart's desire. This gal that was in this camp, this village over there, he sits at Papa's Hill and he plays the flute. And so when you play the flute in that story, um, um, the certain song is there. And so from that process there, I was saying, well, I don't know. I don't know what song to play. I, I know during the story when my Joko would tell him that he'd play these little snippets of the song here. Well, that's all I play to this day too. And uh, the one, the song I play on here, usually that I, use, I put on, a, of all things, a flute workshop where you can sign up 15 people at max in there, sign up for it, and you pay for the materials and some time. And I come in there and I show you how to gather material, how to make the flute, then how to play it. And then when you leave that workshop, you become proficient flute players and flute makers. So you never have to come back to me ever again. So if, so if I ever put on a flute workshop up here, I'll let you guys know. Okay, thank, I think- Thank you again, oh, yeah. Mr. Quackenbush. We're so happy to have you with us. If anyone has any remaining questions, just get onto our Facebook page and leave them there and we'll do our best to get them. All right, thank you folks, Bill. I appreciate thank it. Thank you. Yeah.